you've got to be something special. A man who played in 2,130 consecutive games, hit nearly 500 lifetime homers. These days in the Bronx, there's a man building a baseball history of his own, a history that might someday have him included in the list of Yankee greats like Gehrig and Ruth and DiMaggio and Mantle. Don Mattingly, by consensus these days, baseball's best player. Mattingly of the Yanks, leading them into action today at Comiskey Park in Chicago against the White Sox. It's coming up next on NBC. National Broadcasting Company, now in its seventh decade of bringing you baseball's memories. Baseball's milestones. Baseball's majesty. And baseball's magical moments. Sports proudly presents the Major League Baseball Game of the Week. Today from Comiskey Park, it's the New York Yankees versus the Chicago White Sox. The Game of the Week is brought to you by Miller Brewing Company, sole sponsor of the U.S. Olympic Training Centers. By American Airlines, something special in the air. By Valvoline Motor Oil, where motor oil is not just motor oil. And by U.S. Sprint, we're building the first and only 100% digital fiber optic network clear across America. They call it the Windy City, and if only it would live up to that billing today, any kind of breeze would be appreciated on a sizzling hot day, temperatures well into the 90s at Comiskey Park. Hi, everybody. Bob Costas along with Tony Kubek. It's the first of two on NBC. Vin and Joe later with the Cubs and the Dodgers. Neil Allen will pitch today for the White Sox. His second start since coming back off the disabled list. Tommy John with a record of 9-3 and three, coming off a complete game last Monday at Minnesota will be the Yankee pitcher. Last night, Floyd Bannister and the White Sox prevailed 5-2. Meanwhile, Toronto rallied for a win against Minnesota. The Blue Jays are just a game and a half back of the Yanks. And the Tigers are closing in. They're two behind. Let's check in with Tony now. All right, Bob, thank you very much. With me down in the Yankee dugout just before the ball game, Lou Pinella. Lou, last night, your owner, Mr. Steinbrenner, was in town, and he's been critical of uh, certain things this year, but relatively quiet. Did you have a conversation with him after last night's loss, and what was it about? Well, I haven't talked to Mr. Steinbrenner uh, after uh, the game last night. Uh, I've talked to him about our ball club. Uh, we're concerned. Uh, we've had some injuries. We're not playing all that well, but uh, listen, we're going to survive. Uh, we've got a good ball club here. Do you think there's too much of a sameness in your pitching staff now with the possibility of four left-handed starters with the addition of Trout? No, I don't. Uh, I think that uh, if you look at the records of all these teams around the league, uh, uh, they've been beating right-handed pitchers more predominantly. We have four good left-hand starters plus Rick, plus Rick Roden, and uh, we're in good position there. Two key people. When will Rick uh, Willie uh, Randolph be back, first of all? What about Dave Rigetti? He has struggled a little bit early. Well, Dave Rigetti has got uh, 17 saves, and uh, believe me, uh, we're down to the last 60-some uh, games of the season, and uh, he's going to be our horse coming down the stretch. Uh, uh, as far as Randolph is concerned, uh, uh, he's uh, progressing uh, uh, on time uh, uh, with his rehabilitation, and uh, he'll be back available about the third week in August. Lou, as quickly as you can with an answer to this, I know you were a little bit upset in Minnesota. Some of your players were very vocal that they thought one of your stars, Ricky Henderson, was not putting out. What do you feel about that? Well, listen, uh, I don't really get into particulars uh, with any of our players uh, in the press. Uh, I, I feel that uh, uh, everybody uh, should uh, give 100% at all times. Uh, I feel that uh, this is a, a great time to play baseball. We're in a pennant race. Uh, we're in first place. And uh, just had a meeting and reminded the whole team that, uh, uh, listen, let's give everything we've got and uh, let's not leave anything uh, on the table. Lou, thank you so much. Good luck to you. We'll be back to Comiskey Park in the starting lineups right after this message. At Comiskey Park, Bob Costas with Tony Kubek. The start of today's game will be delayed just a bit. There's a ceremony going on on the field right now, emceed by the legendary Chicago baseball broadcaster, most recently with the Cubs, but in years gone by with the White Sox, Jack Brickhouse. They are retiring the uniform numbers of two great White Sox pitchers of the past, Ted Lyons, a Hall of Famer, 
And Billy Pierce, a guy you faced many times, Tony. Well, Billy, uh, of course, is a left-hander who some people feel should get consideration for baseball's Hall of Fame. Billy, in the center of your picture, that is Jack Brickhouse in the light blue jacket. He's in the special wing of the Hall of Fame. Jack Buck will be there this year. Let's listen in to Jack Brickhouse. Floyd Bannister has been wearing Billy Pierce's number, so he will convert to 24, and they will retire Billy Pierce's number 19. Jim Fregosi also wearing a number that he will give up and take another. Ted Lyons' number had been 16. That's retired for him. They've also retired numbers in the past for Nellie Fox, for Minnie Minoso, for Luis Aparicio, and for Luke Appling. Fox is two, Luke Appling's four, Minnie Minoso's nine, and Luis Aparicio's 11. The first four retired, and now Billy Pierce and Ted Lyons making it six, and those numbers are displayed on the wall in right center field. Ted Lyons, of course, in baseball's Hall of Fame at 260 victories. We talked about Billy Pierce, who won most of his ball games with the Chicago White Sox. They are revealing the numbers out on the right field stands of those that Bob just mentioned who have been retired, adding the names of Lions and Numbers and Billy Pierce. Pierce was an outstanding left-hander. He threw hard, high one loss percentage. He's a real prince of a guy. Still does a lot of work in this area for the White Sox and for this community. And he has won more ball games than some pitchers in baseball's Hall of Fame. I don't know if numbers should be the only criteria in this kind of situation, but he was an awfully good pitcher with some successful teams. You faced him when he worked with the White Sox and also in the 1962 World Series when he was pitching for the Giants and in fact defeated Whitey Ford head to head in the sixth game at Candlestick Park. Billy Pierce, who pitched for that Giants ball club, Windy Candlestick, or I believe it was even windier, along with Jack Sanford from the right side. Two pitches looked like they washed up. They helped anchor that great club with Willie Mays. Jose Pagan was a shortstop, played so well. Hiller, a second baseman. So it's quite an honor for Billy Pierce, Mr. Lyons, those others whose names will go on the right field stands. Billy Pierce threw very hard. Uh, in fact, Moose Gowan, who is here for an old-timers game tomorrow, would get very frustrated at times batting against Billy. Billy, who threw hard at a great slider. And every once in a while, Billy would throw that slow curveball to Moose and to Mickey, and they'd swing it when it bounced, and Moose would get very upset. Nellie Fox, Luke Appling, Minnie Minoso, Luis Aparicio. What a DP combination. Late 50s, early 60s, Aparicio and Fox. Ted Lyons, his number retired today, and Billy Pierce, Number 19, Ted Lyons passed away a year ago to the day of this ceremony. To give you an idea of the type of pitcher he was, in 1942, he started 20 games for the White Sox. He was there at the finish every time. He completed 20 out of 20. He also threw a complete game in a 21-inning affair in 1929 for the White Sox. So talk about your Iron Men. Ted Lyons was one. Show you how things have changed in the, this era of the relief pitcher. Lyons in 21 seasons, 454 games started. He completed 356. We'll be back for our ball game after these messages, folks. Stay with us. Fregosi and Lou Pinella meeting at the plate with the umpires. A glance into the White Sox dugout, they snapped the three-game losing streak last night, and although they're in the basement in the American League West with a record of 38 and 55, 12 and a half off the pace set by Minnesota, and seven back of Texas, which is immediately in front of them in the standings, the White Sox have played a little bit better of late, even with the three-game losing streak. They've won 13 of their last 22, which isn't setting the world on fire, but does represent some progress for Jim Fregosi. And there have been rumors that Larry Himes, the new general manager, and Jim Fregosi do not see eye to eye in a lot of matters. In fact, rumors there have been some pretty volatile discussions behind closed doors. Fregosi not certain what his future is. 
He is an outstanding baseball man. It is his second shot at managing. He has made a study of pitching, which was going to be the strength of this ball club. But they let a lot of pitchers go. They're performing successfully for other franchises. Just take Dave Schmidt with the Baltimore Orioles, for instance. So for Gosey, not sure where he stands. Meanwhile, the Yankees are in the midst of a three-game losing streak. They haven't lost four in a row at any time this year. They've had three separate three-game losing streaks. They'll send Tommy John to the mound today against Neil Allen. Now, Allen, who's about to head out there, has a record of 0-4. He's in the last year of a huge contract. He's collecting $1.3 this year from the White Sox. He knows, no matter how well he had performed this year, he's not going to get a contract from anybody approaching that. But right now, at 0-4, with an ERA of 9, this is only his third start. He's had six relief appearances mixed in around two trips to the disabled list. And with his questionable health, even though he should be in the prime of his career at 29 years of age, Neil Allen's got to prove something to people in the second half of the season in order to get any kind of a contract with somebody, whether it's the White Sox or another club, in 88. Toronto makes a move. They come from behind, overcoming a big deficit against the Twins last night. They move to within a game and a half, and after a slow start since around mid-May, the Tigers are more than 20 games over 500 since the middle of May, and they've moved to within two. They've got a showdown the first week of August coming up with the Yankees. It is not coincidental that the Tigers have made their move almost simultaneously with the fact that Kirk Gibson was back who adds so much spice to that lineup. TJ, let's see if there will be any complaining of scuffed baseballs. When he pitched up in Toronto a couple of weeks ago, they showed balls on television that had cuts in them. Tommy John said anybody could have done it. So we'll see what TJ gets. And of course, he was a member of the White Sox at one time. His career has been salvaged. Neil Allen tried to do that with his. Last time out after two times on the DL, one of them a very strange injury. Injuries come up now that you'd never heard of before. A muscle imbalance in an arm. Here's the lineup you'll face, Bobby. Ricky Henderson is in left field. He's still bothered by a sore left shoulder, which he injured in May in Seattle. It's cut down on his ability to throw, so they move him from center to left. Claudel Washington in center. Mattingly, with the sprained right wrist, was available for pinch hitting duty last night and, in fact, got into the game in the ninth inning, bouncing into a force out. This is his first start after missing three starts. Winfield in right in the cleanup spot. Pasqua back from Columbus, and you can say that of so many members of this Yankee roster. He's the DH. Pagliarulo at third. Salas will catch. Meacham at second base. Willie Randolph won't be back until mid-August, maybe a little later than that. And Tollison has done a steady job all season, the switch hitting shortstop. Well, the Yankees are finding out something during this stretch where they've lost five of six, and they survived without Henderson and Mattingly. Injuries to other people, but they find out trying to survive without a guy like Willie Randolph is not quite as easy, Bob. Here is the stability of a Randolph who helps Tollison at shortstop, relatively new to the position. A guy that gets on base two or three times a game. He is low-key, has been through the pressures of George Steinbrenner and a lot of other managers. Without Willie Randolph, this ball club's struggling. And that's why they tried to get Tony Bernazard. Oakland's got him now. Rumors they might try to get Glenn Hubbard from Atlanta. So basically, they're missing a very important, skilled player in Willie Randolph, and that's hurt them. Here's the defense. Reedus, he's been a disappointment for this ball club. Kenny Williams, outstanding talent. Can he make it? Calderon, a right-handed bat, which they needed desperately for this ball club, hitting home runs, driving in runs. Donnie Hill, he has struggled all year. Ozzie Guijan, he's had an outstanding year. Manrique, that's been a trouble spot, second base. Walker, more off than on this year. Fisk has been outstanding after they said he couldn't catch anymore. He'll catch Allen today. Fisk had a homer last night, and at age 39, catches a day game after a night game, closing in on 300 home runs lifetime. He's at 294. Donnie Hill with some words of advice for Neil Allen, just getting a few signals straight. Meanwhile, Tommy John awaiting his turn in the Yankee dugout. John pitched his first complete game this year, his last time out in Minnesota, and was feeding so many ground balls to those Minnesota hitters that Don Mattingly tied the putout record with 22 of them at first base. One added note before the first pitch, you saw some of the pregame ceremonies. That ran a little longer than expected, 10 or 15 minutes, but Mr. Reinsdorf, one of the owners, sends a note down that unofficially, the late Charlie Lau's number has also been retired, number six. They will not give that number out unless they feel somebody is worthy of carrying that number again. So a tribute to Charlie Lau.
Ricky Henderson stands in at 294. Bothered by a strained right hamstring in addition to the tender shoulder. Breaking ball in the dirt from Neil Allen. He's always had the good curveball. His last outing, a little over 80 pitches, went four strong innings. Jim Fregosi, Dick Bodden said the fastball was a little bit better than average, but the curveball was good. And then he just petered out. They like to see him go seven innings today. That one's at the knees for a call strike from Vic Voltaggio. Greg Kosk, the umpire at first. Rocky Rowe at second. The crew chief, Larry Barnett, at third. Hot, muggy day at Comiskey. Two and one to Ricky Henderson, who has stolen 26. And for the first time in a long time, in danger of relinquishing the stolen base crown in the American League. Harold Reynolds of Seattle leads with 35. Fernandez of the Blue Jays has 30. A liner over again for a game opening single. Along with that shoulder injury you mentioned with Ricky Henderson, Bob, he's also had that hamstring pull, which has settled very deeply into the upper part of the hamstring, the buttock, so it has really restricted his running. He makes things go when he gets out. Can he run, though? We'll find out, especially with the jabbing of the man in the box now. Caudell Washington was on him mercilessly, Ricky Henderson, for what he feels was not giving a good effort. Although no one wants to acknowledge it publicly, it's very plain that Henderson is the guy who's the target of the scorn of some of his teammates, if that's not too strong a word, for, in their view, not giving 100% of late. A little pop to the left side. Gijen drifts in behind Hill for the catch. And that right there might be an indication that Ricky Henderson's leg is not well enough to try and run on Neil Allen's high leg kick. You go after the first pitch, a high inside fastball, without giving your pitcher, Henderson, a chance to read the move to first and the move to home plate. So perhaps that's a tip-off that Ricky is not yet ready to run. in addition to the homers in eight consecutive games and he actually hit 10 in that stretch so in that sense better Dale Long who hit but one in each of the games of his streak for the Pirates in 1956 in addition he set an American League mark with at least one extra base hit in 10 straight games fell short however of the major league record set by big poison Paul Wayner of the Pirates in 1927 Wayner had at least one extra base hit in 14 straight to give you an idea of how Henderson's base running has been hampered. He's been caught in five of his last eight stolen base attempts. You can see the big gap with Walker holding Henderson on that Mattingly, through hits and situations, may try and hook the ball through. Manrique shorting, shading towards second base. On the inside corner, one and one. Vic Voltaggio, who many feel is more of a pitcher's umpire than a hitter's umpire. He has a fairly wide, very liberal pitcher strike zone. Mattingly thought the last pitch was too far inside. Henderson at first with one out on the top of the first. Winfield next. Bouncing ball toward the hole. Henderson stops to let it get past him, and that may hold him to second. He could have made it had he known that Calderon was going to kick it around a little bit, but he had already made up his mind to stop. And because he had to wait for Mattingly's bouncer to get through, Henderson is held at second on a ground single to right field, which you won't see happen that often. Hutch Fisk is going to go out and talk to Neil Allen. I've got to wonder if Neil Allen did not throw a changeup off the fastball on his own. It would be a strange pitch because Mattingly obviously trying to get something off speed to pull through the right side. He may have changed up on his own. He got the ball there, and as you said, holding up for that ball. Ozzie Gijen once called her own to throw behind Ricky as he stumbled a little bit. But another indication of Ricky Henderson with a healthy hamstring, even though he had to hold up, would probably have been on third base because Calderon is not your gazelle pouncing on the ball in right field. You heard Winfield's reaction with Marv Albert on the pregame show to some of the praise he's received this year from George Steinbrenner. He said, well, I tried not to acknowledge it when he was ripping me, so I'm not going to make too much of it when he's lavishing praise on me either. Jen jockeying in behind Henderson at second. That's on the inside edge. 
Voltaggio hasn't pleased either Mattingly or Winfield in this first inning. I'm not sure the 13 innings that makes good press has anything to do really with his tailing off. Watch how fidgety Winfield is at the plate. He is just diving at the ball, jumping on it. Jay Ward, one of the coaches along with Bobby Mercer, have tried to get him to stay back and wait, but he's really lunging and going after it. It could be a fact that he's tired. You know, we're in very hot weather, and it's been much more hot and humid than most times early in the year. Even a big guy like this, but at his age, he may be worn down a little bit, but it'll be just temporary. Henderson at second, Mattingly at first. Allen's 0-1 pitch. Can he commit himself? Yes. Oh, he's got a good curveball. He keeps it down there. It can be tough. You can see what a Ricky Henderson, even with a bad leg, can do to the middle infield. They have shaded to hold him close, both Adi, Ozzie Gijen and Manrique. Winfield starts after, looks like a fastball. It's got such tight rotation. He throws it so hard. He couldn't pick up the speed and the spin. Inside one and two, Allen always had a very good fastball and an excellent curveball, but those were the only two pitches he had with the Mets and then with the Cardinals. It worked just fine when he was saving games out of the Met bullpen, but when the Cardinals made him a starter, two pitches weren't enough. Eventually, he's developed a straight change and that's his third pitch, and that's all he's got. Three pitches in the repertoire. Curveball in the dirt. Three, Bob, two pitches aren't bad. Fastball, curveball, if you can do different things with a fastball, sink it, run it, cut it, ride it, and if you can change speeds on the curveball. So basically, you can, you can throw eight, nine, ten pitches, and if you change your arm action a little bit, the angle of the arm, you get a dozen pitches. But he has always been a guy one speed, everything hard. Hard curve, hard fastball. There's a chainsaw. Curve. Bounced over Hill's head and into left field. Henderson is racing home. Mattingly stops at second. Three singles in this inning. Winfield with his 71st RBI and the Yankees with the lead. Don't know if it is to help the White Sox hitters who have struggled more often than not this year. But Roger Bossert, third generation of Bossert's groundskeeper, has had the front of home plate very hard. You can see what happens. Hit the hard pan, bounded over the third baseman's head. It's a good pitch by Neil Allen, but the hard surface let it get through. Pasquale, one of several who has taken a ride on the Columbus shuttle at 203 with eight home runs. track called her on with the catch in front of the 382 sign and the runners retreat and everybody in the park thought it was gone when it left the bat the wind off Lake Michigan with a little bit of cool cold front supposed to move in they say the temperature is going to drop to the mid 80s make it a lot cooler than it's been but the ball was high the wind is blowing in almost from dead center field and it just killed it I mean, he got the arms out just like he likes to do. You could almost see the reaction of Neil Allen when he released the pitch. Just stayed right in his power zone, and the wind kept it in the ballpark. Haskell can't believe it. He couldn't have placed it on a tee any better than that. He jumped on it, but it comes up short. Now here's Pally Arulo. Give an idea how many people it fooled. It fooled the two base runners, because there is a play with one out, a fly ball that deeply, at least the runner on second base, and that's Matting, who's very smart, should be on third base. But he thought it was going out and he would score. If he's on third, there's a lot more pressure on Neil Allen, Fisk, the inner defense. So Mattingly got fooled also. Voltaggio says that one's good enough, 0-2, and, and Pasqua still can't believe it. Still shaking his head in the Yankee dugout. He is swinging the bat since being recalled from Columbus much more aggressively than when he went down. Not taking as many pitches. It's a tough left-handed hit a lineup as Yankees have. This was hit in the air to center. And that'll do it. So the Yankees get three singles. Pasquas denied, and they settled for a 1-0.
his last time out, Monday at Minnesota, John goes the distance on a seven hitter, allows only one run. Yankees beat the Twins seven to one. He faces this lineup today. Reedus in left, Hill at third, Baines the DH, and he has been unable to play the outfield for two, three months now. Calderon is in right field. Walker at first, Fisk will catch. Kenny Williams, the rookie in center field, Guijan the shortstop, and Manrique bats ninth and plays second base. Tommy John, who had the great fortune in his days with the White Sox to pitch under the tutelage of the Eddie Stankies. Al Lopez, a Hall of Famer. Tommy John always had the good sinker ball. He said it became better after the elbow surgery, which has become so famous, done by Dr. Job. Said that when he got that surgery, he had to change the position of his thumb on the ball, and it sunk even more. Henderson, Washington, Winfield, they can all run. Pagliarulo, Tallison, Meacham at second, Mattingly back at first. Mark Salas, the catcher, and Tommy John, who just goes on and on, doesn't he, Bob? Doesn't do it with velocity, he really never did. It's movement on the ball, location, and great change of speeds. Something to keep in mind, Voltaggio apparently has a very liberal strike zone today. Generally speaking, that's true of him, and today it might even appear to be more true than usual. John, if anybody is going to take advantage of it, is the guy who can do it. He's going to find out how far there he was can right move there. that ball inside and outside, and he's going to use whatever strike zone Voltaggio allows him. The second pitch was down and away, and Salas will set up there again, and Tommy goes six inches farther out. You'll test Voltaggio, as you said. Reedus has been a, a disappointment, to say the least. They thought he'd be the right-handed bat. Look at what the Yankees have done with TJ on the mound. Something about that, although John has pitched excellent baseball more often than not, and this one is taken into right field for a base hit. So Reedus, as Henderson did in the top half, opens with a single. John has occasionally had bad games and hasn't had to pay for it. He was trailing 9 nothing against Roger Clemens in that game at Yankee Stadium a month or so ago where the Yanks somehow rallied and won. He was also on the short end of a 7 nothing score against Minnesota, and the Yankees came back and won that game. Bobby Meacham said afterwards, it just shows how much we love TJ. We won't let him lose. So his 9-3 and record includes an element of luck. Jim Fergosi may play for one run early with Donnie Hill, who has really struggled with the bat, has had problems with his eyes, so he may bunt early. He may also fake bunt, give Reedus a chance to steal. You know, Tommy John, I think, is going to be hurt by the presence of Trout, who pitched last night. They are similar in styles, and hitters see similar pitchers two or three days in a row, and they can hurt the pitching staff. You go back to the Montreal staff with Gullix and Sanderson and Rogers, all power pitchers. There was a sameness. Toronto with Steve Clancy and Leal, a sameness. Now they've got four starters, Trout a sinker baller, Tommy John a sinker baller. I think TGL will get hurt by it. You can see by the first base set, Reedus going the opposite way in the sinker ball. He saw Trout last night. Reedus has stolen 29, including his last 10 attempts in a row. Hill showing a bond and taking a ball. We mentioned that Henderson is not the league leader in stolen bases, which is a surprising situation. In fact, he's fifth. Reynolds, Fernandez, Reedus, and Willie Wilson of the Royals, Reedus and Wilson each with 29, are all ahead of him. Henderson with 26. Tommy, one. Tommy had an inkling he was going, so he quick pitched. He came to the pause, so a ball wasn't called, but he just glided with that front leg into the pitch. Didn't lift the knee. He buried his delivery for Reedus. Switch hitter Hill hitting just 191, swings and misses. If you kept the pitching chart today, as they're doing in both dugouts, and Stan Williams of the Yankees upstairs, Bart Johnson of the White Sox doing the same thing, you would probably find out that hitters swing at more balls of Tommy John than almost any other pitcher in the big leagues. An indication right there, a vicious sinker that was almost on the ground. Hitters get themselves off, out of Tommy more than not. As a hitter, how do you prevent it? You tell yourself, they can bring it up, you still go out there and swing at a grounder off TJ. His one-two pitch. 
Hit in the air to right center field. Claudel Washington is over. Reed is back to tag to at least draw a throw, and he's holding. Any lackadaisical play, Reedus would have taken advantage of it. You could almost hear Art Kushner coaching at first base with Eddie Brinkman off the hard bypass, yelling from the tag up in case he won't. Now it's Baines who had an opposite field home run against left-hander Steve Trout last night. An unsuccessful return to Comiskey Park for the former White Sox pitcher Trout. The home run extends Baines' hitting streak to 18. One shy of his personal best of 19 back in 1983, the division winning season for the White Sox. Longest batting streak in the majors this year, Wade Boggs with 25. Last night off Trout, the book on Baines was to keep the ball away with breaking stuff, but today off another left hander, he's moved six to eight inches closer to the plate. So you try and pitch a good hitter like this the same way, a couple of days in a row, even at bats in a row, and he will adjust, and Baines has gotten closer to the plate as T.J. keeps the ball away. One and one, a knee injury, which has limited his mobility, has confined Baines to D.H. duty. He's about ready to play defensively. Darren Johnson, hitting instructor, tells us, as does Jim Fergosi. He's very close. There he goes, swing and a miss, throw from Salas, and Reedus has stolen his 11th straight and his 30th of the season. Pitch to run on, off-speed breaking ball. Salas not known for his throwing. Strength of the arm is not bad. The breaking pitch, but the release time was very slow by Mark Salas. Tim McCarver the other night talking about Salas, the last of the palindromes, national publication. He didn't have a great jump, but Salas didn't get rid of the ball. I think they forgot Eddie Kazak, K-A-Z-A-K, -A -A among that list of palindromes, didn't they? Ball well, players whose names are spelled the same frontwards and backwards, as is the case with S-A-L-A-S Salas. Change of speeds, and Baines becomes the first strikeout victim today for John. You're talking about two-pitch pitchers, and basically that's what Tommy John is. Curveball, fastball, but he will do so many things off each one. Pull the string, make the slider look like a curveball or a slur. Occasion, we will try and show you close-ups of Tommy John to see if you can, in fact, pick up something from a camera that might say he is scuffing the baseball, as he is always accused of, along with Mike Scott and Don Sutton and on and on. Nolan Ryan. They find these strange cuts on Tommy John's baseballs, or they say they are the ones he threw, right over the name of Dr. Bobby Brown, almost identical every time. Almost over the same initial in the name. And the same has been true of Rick Roden in games where yeah. he's pitched. They not only find scuffed baseballs, they find them scuffed in an identical fashion, apparently, in the identical spot. And Mike Schmidt tells the story of retrieving the ball that was used for his 494th home run when he passed Lou Gehrig on the all-time list last year. And the ball had a scuff on it. Sure enough, Roden was the pitcher against whom Schmidt hit the homer. Tommy John was talking to Voltaggio about the possibility of a check swing, won an appeal, and Voltaggio wouldn't give it to him. Tommy John pointed to a third base umpire with a right-handed interim. If you ask for the appeal, it's supposed to be automatic. Tommy John knows first base is open. Collar on a right-handed hitter with Walker who has struggled, so they're now going to put him on. He wasn't going to throw him a strike. Tommy said, hey, look, if you're going to swing at something a foot out of the strike zone, okay, but I've got a base to play with. Calderon hitting home runs. We got a lot of RBIs with not that many at bats after coming off the DL. Lou Pinnell along with Mark Connor. Connor the closest to you. He's the pitching coach of a long line of Mr. Steinbrenner pitching coaches. One of the White Sox problems this year has been the performance of Walker. These are respectable numbers for other players, but he's the kind of guy they expect to hit 290, drive home 95 to 100. It's softly in the left field, and Henderson is there. John is out of the inning. The White Sox strand two. After one at Comiskey Park, the Yankees lead it 1-0. Yeah. A few in the dizzying series of moves made this year by the Yankees. 
Now, some of these moves may reflect impulsiveness, but in fairness, you have to say that the Yankees have what may be a very progressive understanding of modern-day baseball, which is that you can use your AAA affiliate to a certain extent as an extension of your major league roster. You can look upon your team as having 28, 29 available players who can give you a performance at the major league level. Eddie Einhorn, one of the White Sox owners, seated to the left of George Steinbrenner. And some of those have been to shake guys up by Mr. Steinbrenner, I think with Woody Woodward, and of course they confer more often than not with Lou Pinella, but some just like Rasmussen, for instance, to get him straightened out. He was in the five, fifth man in the five-man rotation now that they've got Trout, so he's going to get opportunities to pitch. Rasmussen had won five in a row. They sent Hudson down. He was seven and two at one time. They had an off day this past Thursday, another one coming up Monday when they play in the Hall of Fame game. And they've already got it penciled in that Rasmussen will pitch August 1st against the Tigers. Curveball dropping in there to Salas. 0-2. Oh and, and so this was a calculated move, not a fit of peak to punish Dennis Rasmussen. They have him pitching in rotation at Columbus. He pitched Wednesday. He's going to pitch Monday at Cooperstown in the Hall of Fame game against the Braves. Curveball got him. Couple of beauties there to put Salas away. Salas up on the plate because they want him to pull the ball for that short porch and the ball, which I think Pudge Fest catching today, along with Bob Boone from California, Gary Carter when he's healthy, do better than anybody. Take that outside pitch, that backdoor breaking ball, and kind of bring it back into the outside corner. That's the reason that Lamar Hoyt had such a good year, the Cy Young year with Fist catching him. Hoyt now back a product, but he's back at home reconditioning his arm. Belongs to the White Sox again. Beecham trying to fill in in the absence of Willie Randolph. Juan Bonilla also brought up from Columbus. Bonilla played last night. Walker and Manrique. Walker in foul ground makes the catch. You know, Bob, you talk about that Columbus shuttle, which we just showed you a list of. You know, the party line for the Yankees is that we're doing it for the sake of Rasmussen. I wonder if anybody ever asked Rasmussen about that, how he feels about going. Anytime you go to the minor leagues, it's not a pleasant thing after you come off an 18-1 season. Rasmussen's reaction to it was very calm and very rational. They explained it to him. Manella did the explaining. Said you're going to pitch in rotation. We know the exact date you're coming back. You're going to work against the Tigers. We like to throw you against Detroit. You've had good success against the Tigers. And that's the way it's going to be. But in the meantime, even though it's a short period of time, that time doesn't count to his pension plan, I don't believe. Which seems like a little thing, a fringe benefit. But... Hey, life's tough sometimes. Ball one to Tolleson. One and one with two out and nobody on in the top half of the second. Yankees leading one nothing on an RBI hit by Winfield in the first. Donnie Hill, very tight at third base in case Tollison tries to beat one out. And here's a slow hopper to Guijen. Easy hop, and he guns him down. Perfect inning for Neil Allen to the bottom of the second in sweltering Chicago. one nothing Yanks. Well, he's more than halfway there, still pitching effectively at age 44. He has resurrected his career no less than three separate times. When the White Sox traded him to the Dodgers after the 1971 season, he was 28 years old and coming off three sub-500 years. And at that point, people thought his best days might have been behind him. Then, of course, he had the serious arm difficulties, missed the entire 1975 season and half of the preceding year after injuring the arm. And Dr. Job out in Los Angeles performed the complicated surgery on him. And then after that, after some great years with the Dodgers and with the Yankees in the late 70s, early 80s, the Angels gave up on him in 85, and they released him. He pitched briefly with Oakland and then hooked on again with the Yanks. And as a member of the Yankees in the last two seasons, he's 14-6. and six. So I count no fewer than three separate times where he was counted down and nearly out. How about the guys pitching against right now? They talked about Carlton Fisk being washed up as a catcher about four or five years ago. Tried to make him a left fielder last year. DH first base outfield. Very sparse time catching him, but he has caught a lot of games the last month and a half. Tollison at short, easy chance, plenty of time with Fisk running, and he's got it. We're going to check the scoreboard. Toronto is playing an afternoon game, which is of interest 
to the Yankees. Toronto coming back yesterday with a seven run eighth inning was it? Well, here's Detroit one nothing. Petrie is a scheduled starter today and if he keeps getting on the beam Detroit will in fact be in a pen race. Cleveland they are second last in the league in scoring runs and they are scuffling. The Texas Cleveland game is Charlie Huff against Phil Necro. Huff is 10 and 6. Phil Necro is 7 and 9. Petrie is the starter for Detroit today against Jerry Royce. Talk about a guy who has risen like the proverbial Phoenix from the ashes. It's Royce who was just battered every time he went out there in the National League with the Dodgers and then with the Reds. And Cincinnati's pitching four, but Pete Rose and company gave up on him. He goes to the Angels. Royce is 3 and 1. Royce Sturr fouls this one back. Jerry Rice has been released by two teams. I guess it will show you the desperation. This is not a knock at Jerry Rice. He obviously can still pitch. But the fact that he's been released a couple of times, there's so many pitchers who've been career minor leaguers in the minor league seven, eight years, but the desperation for pitching is such that a lot of careers are being resurrected now. Here's a little softly hit ball that dunks into center field for a base hit for Kenny Williams. A kid who's got outstanding ability. He's a 9-3 sprinter, played football at Stanford, and getting instructed by Art Kushner, and Kenny Williams has a good throwing arm. They think he'll hit 15 to 20 home runs. It's just a matter of getting the playing time and learning how to play the game. Still doesn't know how to steal a base, although I think someday he could be a big base stealer. Jan, the 1985 American League Rookie of the Year, proving that timing is everything. Had he come along a year later, no matter how outstanding he had been, he could have forgotten about it with Joyner and Canseco and Covilia, Tartable, Snyder. But in 85, the time was right. And he slaps that one right through. Ali Aruno was in close, protecting against the bunt. And Gijen goes that way. The White Sox have two on with one out. Can I tell you something that Gijen told me before the ball game? This yeah. is, I mean, it's almost ironic. It's, you know, he's, he kids around with everybody. And he says, as the ball is slapped by Pelly, he said, there are going to be 50 million people watching the meet, me today at home on satellite in Venezuela. He said, the first time up, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. You're going to play me in. I'm going to hit the ball by him at third base. Now, I'm not saying the kid has some kind of clairvoyance and he's having a good year, but even you do not have that kind of impressions. If only you had shared that with us prior to <laughs> no. a bat, it would have what? been so much more impressive. I wouldn't, he was not going to say it and embarrass the kid if he didn't do it. But he did tell me that. There they go, the runners are going and the ball bounces away from Salas. It'll be scored as a double steal. Williams to third and Gijen to second. Lou Pinella is out to argue with Vic Voltaggio. I'm wondering if he is saying that Manrique interfered with Salas going after the ball. He swings at it. What did he call it? He's got to call it a strike, obviously. Or they say he may have tipped and fouled it, and the runner should go back. A club that's having trouble scoring runs, as the White Sox have most of this year, although they've been better about the last three weeks. They've had about a 275, 280 team batting average, but Jim Fregosi knows he's got to force things on the base path. He picked a good pitch to do it on. I think Lou is arguing that they may he may have tipped the ball. Well, very hard to tell from yeah. that replay. It was a perfect pitch to, pitch to center man, wasn't it, though? Second and third now with one out, and that one's Lota Manrique who played for Jim Fregosi at Louisville when Fregosi managed the Cardinals' top farm club. This ball is rolled towards second. The White Sox will tie the game. Meacham throws him out. Gijen the third as Williams crosses the plate. with a chance to give the White Sox the lead. He opened the last half of the first with a single to right. We saw a 
reports on the Texas Cleveland and California Detroit games. Toronto's game should also be underway at home against Minnesota. Les Straker, five and six against John Cerruti, who's six and two. Toronto a game and a half back of the Yanks. Detroit trails by two. Strike one to Reedus. Reedus having a terrible time trying to adjust to the difference in the style of pitching from the National League to the American League. Where they will throw you two and one, two and oh, three and one, three and two breaking balls, more fastballs in the other league, and he just can't adjust it. Another base hit for him as Chicago's in front. And again, he goes to the opposite field against Tommy John. Tommy John trying to run something in on his fist, and he just fisted it out that way. Up in the strike zone, which was the problem. If it's down, it's a weak ground ball up. It's got the loft right with it. You gotta do is serve it out there. You know, Jim Fregosi has got his team, even though they really struggle all year playing with an awful lot of enthusiasm. You just saw it on the bench. Something that Lou Pinella has tried to do during this skid by the Yankees over the last week. A lot of that is because of Ozzie Gijan, who just loves to play and loves to entertain. Reedus stole a base the last time he was aboard. Donnie Hill, who was on the disabled list for a stretch this year because he couldn't get used to his contact lenses. Switching back and forth from the glasses to the lenses. And Reedus going on the first pitch. Salas tries again, and he's in there. Now, Joel Skinner was the kid they got from the White Sox. They said was going to be the catcher of the future. You can see Salas slap down on the ball instead of the palm up where he'd come up throwing. It cost or gave an extra step or two to Reedus. And again, he just misses them because of the way he caught the ball and released it. The book on Salas always has been very useful offensive player, dangerous left-handed hitter, weak defensively. He disputes that, contending he simply never got enough chance in the Cardinal organization, or more recently with Minnesota, to play on a regular basis behind the plate, improve his skills, and show people what he could do. Even though Tommy John's release to home plate is very quick when he speeds it up, he is not the easiest guy to throw on, and I'm not defending Salas, but with the ball sinking as it does, so many times it's in the dirt, you always find yourself digging it out or near digging it out, which takes a little more time to come out of the crouch. The 2-0 pitch. Down the right field line and foul. It's a little bit like blaming the catcher who leads the league in pass balls when he's catching a staff that includes a couple of knuckleballers. And there's one stat that they put in all these statistic sheets that we get that I think really is unfair to catchers. They say this catcher has thrown out only 20% of the those attempting to steal. Well, that's unfair because the pitcher's got an awful lot to do with that. Just look at Bob Boone. They said he couldn't throw it. Philadelphia he goes over to the American League with Gene Mock's staff. And he leads the league two years in a row, throwing guys out. Paris leads the league in the American League, goes to Philadelphia. He can't throw anybody out. It's a stat I think they should remove because it is really an unfair indictment of some catchers. Three and one to Donnie Hill. Mock staffs in Minnesota and in California have always been good as a group at holding runners close. It's not an accident or a coincidence. He teaches it. Baines is next if Hill prolongs the inning. The White Sox have scored twice in this last half of the second, and they've taken a 2-1 lead. And this ball is spanked to left, but Henderson, literally in his tracks, makes the catch. So they settle for two and the lead, and we'll be back after these messages from your local station. This is the first half of a doubleheader today on NBC, a doubleheader with a distinctly Chicago flavor. It'll be the Cubs and the Dodgers with Vin Scully and Joe Garagiola from Dodger Stadium a bit later on. Cubs prevailed there last night, 6-4. to four. Henderson to start it. We mentioned he's in danger. 
of relinquishing that stolen base crown. It'd be the first time since 1979 when Willie Wilson led with 83 that someone other than Henderson has topped the American League in thefts. He's won it seven straight years. Ball one to him. The American League record and Major League record for consecutive years leading the league in steals held by Luis Aparicio. His first nine seasons with the White Sox, 56 through 64, he did it. Maury Wills led the National League six straight years, 60 through 65, so Henderson has already exceeded that. One and one to him. Some of it for Henderson this year, a little bit last year, of course. Injuries this year, last year, the added duress of playing center field, but also the Yankees, a big inning ball club, so he is not attempting to steal quite as much. Whoa! That's a squirt out of his hands. I think the breaking ball is just went squirt, but, I mean, it's not a knockdown pitch, obviously. It's like eight feet over his head. Obviously, Neil Allen's bid, and undoubtedly successful, to make it onto this week in baseball, or yeah. Marv yeah. Albert's Achievement <laughs> Awards. He may score twice. Look like Ryan Duren after his last warm-up pitch when he came in out of the bullpen. Throwing up on the screen. Then defog his glasses. It seems like strange things happened with Neil Allen. He's been known to be a a little flaky at and times. I think he would accept that with, without the slightest offense taken. He can be a wacky funster on occasion. <laughs> Here's his 2-2 pitch. Look Whoa, out. He got him. Two balls, two strike, fastball. Looked like it got him in the bicep. We're not sure. I'll tell you something about Neil Allen. He rarely, and I mean rarely, hits a batter. That is only the sixth career hit batsman for Neil Allen. In over 800 innings pitched. There's a lot of the times he was in relief. I talked to him about it, and, and also Jim Fergus says, no, he doesn't fear pitching inside. It has nothing to do with it. He has never hit a left-handed batter. Now, some people say that that, that shows, as you pointed out, that he's unwilling to pitch inside to left, and he may have to establish he, the plate. He may have trouble getting the ball inside the lefties because the ball tails back over the plate, which is not uncommon for some right-handed pitchers, but more so young right-handers who are afraid to start the ball inside because it drifts over to the center of the plate, and they don't start inside far enough against left-handers. Let's see if this upset Ricky Henderson, and he may be running. chase back and it's pretty close over there to put it in perspective Allen has averaged hitting a batter about once every 140 innings pitched the league average is about two and a half batters hit for every 100 innings of play not going on the first pitch to Washington which is up and in even a guy like Floyd Bannister who is frequently criticized for not having the inclination to pitch inside, for not pitching as tough inside to right-handed batters, in his case, he being a left-hander, as he should. Bannister has hit 1.6 batters for every 100 innings he has worked in his career. So he is about three times as likely to hit a batter as Neil Allen. Well, I think Neil Allen is smart enough to know that he didn't want to wake up Ricky Henderson, who's been a little bit of a funk. Hitting him could wake a guy like this up. Ricky has had uh, the good fortune to be gifted so tremendously in so many areas that he seems to be able to turn the spigot on and off. And some say when he feels like playing, he's the best leadoff is to hitter in the history of the game, and I believe that's true. Power, speed, on-base average, who's been better than that? Very close. Hutch Fest keeps signaling it out to Neil Allen to help him out. Step off, keep throwing over. Ricky Henderson had that little bit lower of a crouch during this series of pitches where it appears to get more spring in, it, spring in his legs like he is going. Want to know the count to Claudel. Top of the third, Yanks trail 2-1. Henderson at first, nobody out. 
Do you play with or against first baseman who would try and punish a good base dealer by tagging him harder and harder, even when the play wasn't close? Well, I saw it. They did it to Maury Wills almost one whole year. I mean, he was so black and blue and bruised and everything else. He is going on the 1-0 pitch, and Washington pops it up. Henderson didn't pick it up right away. Has to retreat to first. Has plenty of time. And Manrique makes the catch. Twice. Claude Al Washington's been up, and he's a veteran player. First time he's got Ricky up, he swings at the first pitch, pitch it, pops it up. Ricky's got a good jump. He's been working Neil Allen. One ball, no strikes. Claude Al swings at the pitch again. He doesn't get to give the guy a chance. The best dealer, base dealer in the game. His history shows it when healthy, and he doesn't give him a chance to get in scoring position for him. That's not good baseball. That's why they miss Willie Randolph hitting the number two spot right there. He could take and take and take, did not fear hitting with two strikes, and Ricky Henderson with Randolph batting, and I know it's not there now. Henderson sitting on second base for Mattingly. As the day began, Boggs was at 368 to lead the American League. Trammell and Mattingly each at 337. Donnie hiked that a little bit with a single in the first. Mattingly missed several days of taking batting practice with the bad right wrist. He took it yesterday, saw it, said he felt all right, but the test will come when he has to swing hard or adjust his swing for a breaking ball or a slider or check his swing to see if the heavily taped wrist is really, really sound. Now you're looking at a situation if Henderson does steal, and I'm not saying he won't, but they got a base open to try and pitch around Mattingly with a guy who's a little bit of a slump, Winfield behind him, and he's right-handed also. steps off and throws obviously trying to alter that rhythm as a substitute for a great move to first trying to get Ricky off stride a little bit situation right now where I think a pitcher would be smart to forget about Ricky with Mattingly up say so you want to take it I've got a base open then and focus on one man and that's the guy with the bat in his hand and that's Mattingly and he works to the plate for ball one. Mattingly, after a slow start, by his standards, hit more than half of his season's total of home runs in the space of about a week. He got 10 in that eight-game stretch. He has 18 for the season. When that back was bothering him, before he went on the DL, he cut down his swing so his average is skyrocketing. He was almost like pecking away at the ball and getting singles. Of which he has two today. Henderson just trots down to second and holds. First and second, one out. Each club has four hits. Winfield drove home the Yankee run with a single in the first. Did you notice, Bob, that Hutch Fisk has sped up the way he calls the game? I think that was a little bit of a difference of opinion that he had, not only with Tony La Russa and Dave Duncan when they were here, now they're, of course, at Oakland, but with Jim Fregosi. Dick Bosman. They didn't want him to take so much time to get the pitcher out of his rhythm, so he's calling a quicker game. On the Yankees' off day here on Thursday, Dave Winfield was honored by the Peace Museum in Chicago because of his charitable work. There's a curveball for a strike. Winfield has put out a book called Turn It Around, No Room for Drugs. And he was honored as one of 20 individuals or institutions who have made positive contributions to society. That Winfield Foundation is something he established, working against drug abuse, trying to help impoverished kids. And he did it before it was fashionable to become involved in causes such as that. That one's low. He hasn't just talked a good game. He's put his money where his mouth is, hasn't he? Henderson at second, Mattingly at first. Ricky was hit by a pitch, but after Washington popped up, Mattingly singled the left. And here's the 1-1 from Allen to Winfield. Curveball and a chopper, gloved by Hill. His play is to second. Didn't get him. Safe. The bases are loaded. Oh, he's off the bag. Oh, oh, the bag. oh, no. And he's gone. He overslid it. 
certain bases should have been loaded. Popped up. He thought that he was out, although the safe sign was given by Rocky Rowe at second base. Wow. The kind of thing that Don Mattingly doesn't usually do. Not if there's one thing he does not have as a player is running speed. But he is a good base runner until that right there. It was a tough play for a guy who's been a second baseman, Donnie Hill. Manrique digs it out. The safe sign's given, and Mattingly thought he was out and drifts off the base, and he is gone. The second out, how that changes. The things that happen even to great players like Mattingly when a team is in a slump. Wonder what Mr. Steinbrenner thought of that. The man who he said, the millstone's around your neck now, pal. You got almost $2 million. Your arbitration. And you better carry the team on your back. Pasqua takes a ball. The ruling on the play is a hit. Since mm -hmm. Mattingly had already attained the base, and then he comes off and is tagged out by Guijan. So Winfield gets credit for a base hit on the play. Pasqua rocked one to the 382 sign in right center his first time up. Both he and Neil Allen thought he'd hit it out, but it died on the warning track. 2-0. That's why Jim Fregosi likes Freddie Manrique. And you said he had him triple A ball in the Cardinal organization. He said he can play a lot of different positions. I know he won't hit a lot. He has trouble with the breaking ball. But his head's in the game. Of course, you got two Venezuelans who communicate well. Guijan and Freddie Manrique in the center of the diamond. It was an alert, alert play, really, because Mattingly didn't drift that far off the back. Tom Seaver, when he was here with the White Sox, as Guijan broke in in 85, praised Guijen's knowledge of the game for such a young player. The way he studied and understood strategy, his awareness of what was going on everywhere on the field at all times. And coming from Seaver, that's truly high praise. The 2-0. It's softly into shallow left. It's Guijen coming out, and in comes Reedus, and he makes the catch. The base running wonder might have cost the Yankees. They come up empty. Here's another look back at a very special Olympic moment. Ron Guidry, two and four since his return, but very sharp in his last few outings as the Yankee pitcher tomorrow against Rich Dotson, who is seven and six. Bannister pitched last night. Dotson tomorrow, and all season long, it seems as if both of them have been in the showcase, and the Yankees have been among the clubs interested, but the price apparently hasn't been right. Pasqua's name seems to come up in every deal, and the Yankees haven't given up on him yet. Well, to get Trout, the Yankees got gave up two really outstanding arms. Took, took spare. we don't know what he'll do. He's been up and down with the Yankees. But the kid Wilkins and the kid Shide, some scouts say they have great arms. Talked to Hugh Alexander in Cal Kansas City last week, now scouting for Dallas Green. Said, I don't know if these kids will make it, but they've got two of the best throwing arms in the minor leagues. You know, they keep saying the Yankees pitching staff is so bad. They said that about it last year but they went into the last week before Boston beat them. They said it was even worse the year before. They got eliminated the second last day of the season by Toronto, and it all balls down to Yankee Stadium. They've got all the left-handers. 81 games there. It is a very forgiving ballpark, and your staff can survive and become more than mediocre over the long haul. Bain struck out swinging in the first, carrying a 316 average into today's game. Member of the American League All-Star squad. And that's a strike. You mentioned Steve Trout. Upon becoming Tommy John's teammate, Trout informs TJ that he had met him when he was 10 years old. Steve's dad, Dizzy Trout. Ground ball to shortstop. Tolleson juggles it and won't make the play. Had he picked it up after the first bobble, he still would have had a crack at Baines. But no. And obviously score at E6 to open the last half of the third. Tolleson has been very steady. He is playing with a damaged shoulder from diving after a ball, going after a pop-up. How do things change? Well, we look at Mr. George Steinbrenner, whose defense has been pretty good this year, to say the least. He's a very emotional man. Some say volatile. But Tolleson let it play him. This team's coming off the artificial surface where you can wait on balls in Minnesota. And the grass slowed it down, upset his timing. Just to finish up, Dizzy Trout had introduced the 10-year-old Steve Trout to Tommy John. And he said, oh, yeah, Tommy, you gave me your glove. You gave me an autograph. 
DJ just sighed and said it's more of the same. Maybe Tollison can atone by starting a double play. And he does, 6-4-3. The big strikeout pitchers, like home run hitters, get all the attention, but isn't it nice if you're Tommy John, to one pitch you can pitch yourself out of a possible inning? Two outs, one pitch. Baines knew he had no chance at all to break it up, so he just veered out of the baseline toward the outfield side. That'll bring up Walker. Ball one to him. Tommy says, more of the same. Yeah, I faced Jose Tartable, and now I've pitched to Danny Tartable. Yes, I faced Tito Francona, and I've pitched against Terry Francona. Heck, Mark McGuire's father was my dentist. Need there be more proof that I spanned several generations. Mattingly, with the putout, just waves TJ off, and that'll do it. No runs, no hit. An error? It didn't matter much. And we move on to the fourth. Cubs and Dodgers coming up a little bit later on, second half of the NBC Sports doubleheader. Bob Tewksbury, the former Yankee, scheduled to start today. They have Tim Leary listed for the Dodgers, but Leary came in in relief yesterday. I wonder if it would be Alejandro Pena. Lou Pinella trying to stir his ball club up. Those five losses in the last six games, this Yankee team has scored just 19 runs. It's a team that... Right running one and two with the Tigers. Tigers lead the American League in run score. The Yankees are second. The Yankees are on a pace, if maintained, that would push them just over 200 home runs for the season. They hit about 202, 203 at this pace. There are several clubs in the majors on a 200 home run pace. It would be the first time the Yankees have done it since the legendary 1961 team which set the Major League mark with 240, led by Maris and Mantle. 2-0 to Pags. He flied the deep center his first time up. He's hit 19 homers. 3-0. Did you read about the interview that Mike Pagliarulo did with a young writer in Minnesota? Sat in front of the locker of Mattingly without his shirt on and did 10 minutes where he was obnoxious, arrogant, which is very unmattingly like. So finally said, don't print that, somebody said. That really wasn't Don Mattingly. That was the very heavily Boston-accented Mike Pagliarulo who's putting you on. Allen works 3-1 and one and walked him to open the top half of the fourth. Allen had hit a batter earlier. That's the first man he's walked. The last game Neil Allen won came at the expense of the Yankees. Last July 20th at Yankee Stadium, it was probably the best game of Allen's career. He pitched a two-hitter, went all the way, wasn't overpowering anybody that day, didn't walk anybody, didn't strike anybody out, but shut the Yankees down on two hits. After that, a series of injuries. It's almost like he's in spring training or just coming out of spring training for the start of the season. So with a guy like Allen, you don't know what you're going to get. Last couple of pitches to Pal Uri. Didn't look like he threw them very hard, almost aimed them, but you get that kind of inconsistency. Salas struck out his first time. Ripped foul. You know, coming in, Bob... Dick Bosman, the White Sox pitching coach, and of course, Jim Fergosi thought they were going to have an outstanding staff. We've talked about the injuries, but Dotson started to come back after his problem with his shoulder. Last year, he's pitched well. They expected more from Bannister because they changed his approach to pitching. Made him not as much a power pitcher. He has struggled. De Leon over. So boy, we got here. We got an outstanding arm. He has struggled. Bob James has been off and on out of the pen. That one finds the hole. Aliarulo to second and stops there. Man, so that's two on with nobody out. One of those situations where you get a ground ball if the grass holds up like that, you'd expect first to third. But yesterday, the Yankees got burned. They were down by three runs with two outs, and Winfield got thrown out at home plate, which I'm certain upset Mr. Steinbrenner. And so right now, they are trying to just play base to base. So there's no first and third situation where it looked like there was going to be. Let me just voice an opinion. 
about the reaction, the public reaction and the media reaction to George Steinbrenner. There have been times when I have disagreed with his specific moves and at times the spirit of those moves and the tone with which he ran his organization. However, I believe it's gotten now to the point. Is that De Leon getting loose down there? Or Bill Long. Long. Bill, Bill Long. Long, who gives the Yankees trouble the times he's pitched against them. Some off-speed stuff. They're looking for a bunt now, Bob. We'll finish up on Steinbrenner after this pitch to Meacham. You bunt, though, and then you got Tallis and the nine-hitter up. He pops it back, and Fisk can't get to it. I think it's now gotten to the point where a lot of people will not evaluate George Steinbrenner on the basis of what he is doing at present. For example, would, would we take a shot of any other owner after a shortstop kicks a ground ball? Would we no. question every single roster move and push it back onto the owner of any other team? And I, I'm just saying that sometimes the guy is not guilty as charged. We're looking for things sometimes where nothing is there. It's He's like, an owner watching his ball club with another owner here today. I don't think it's that big a deal. He's got a horse running in the area, but it's like yesterday when Winfield got thrown out, when there were some misplays or runs not driven in. Writers are running every other inning to see what the reaction of George Steinbrenner was in the privacy of Mr. Reinsdorf and Mr. Einhorn's box. But they wouldn't do that with another owner either. You're right. He, bottom line is all he's interested in. Yes, he does meddle sometimes too much, although not this year, as most people will tell you. There are phone calls to Harvey Green, the PR guy, right during the ball game to find out things and do things and whatever else. But I think Lou Pinella really has been a great buffer between Mr. Steinbrenner and the players. Bottom line for him is win, and that's it. You get the job done. If you're not getting the job done, you're getting sent down or you're getting fired. When Steinbrenner had Neil Allen briefly in 1985, he forbade him to wear number 13, which he had worn with the Mets and with the Cardinals. He said, look, let's start anew. Let's clean the slate. Neil wearing number 33 now with the White Sox. Meacham switched it for five years. They had him start doing it when he was in the Cardinal organization to take advantage of his speed. And they said he never hit breaking stuff to the right side. Now Meacham and Mike Ferraro with a two ball, one strike count will have a conference. Instead of flashing a sign, it might be stolen. Ferraro might have figured out what the rotation in the infield might be in a bunt. He might be triggering him where he might want to aim the ball in case he hits away. Watch Donnie Hill, whether he's going back to third, and only Allen and Walker will cover on the bunt. They may say, hey, look, if he lays it in there on this pitch, don't bunt. Shorten up and then slap it by him. He's going to bunt. And he gets a good one down. Fisk wants to make the play. Whoa. Got a hurry, and he's safe. The bases are loaded. Wanted a sacrifice, winds up with a hit. Fisk yelled, Neil Allen off, his play. Meets him with that speed from the right side. Deadens it perfectly. It barely reaches the grass with that backspin. Fisk will holler him off. It was just the speed of Meacham and a perfectly dropped down butt. It causes a lot of trouble with nobody out in the bases jam. That'll get Dick Bosman out. Even had Donnie Hill been charging, and he wasn't, he was really covering third base, and it was really two, a pitcher and an infielder, covering the entire area in front of the whole plate. But I don't think Donnie Hill could have got him even had he been charged, unless he was way, way halfway up. So the Yankees have them loaded with nobody out in the top half of the fourth, trailing two to one, but they've got seven hits in three innings plus against Neil Allen. He's also walked one and hit a man. And Long continues to get ready. Fregosi, one of those whose name is frequently mentioned when you talk about managers who might be on the ropes. His demeanor does not reflect the man under tremendous stress. He's a happy-go-lucky guy, at least outwardly. Tollison takes a strike. He grounded a short his first time up. Reedus extremely shallow in left field. 
as he should be with Tollison batting from the left side, but he's at almost little league depth. much more shallow. And for every time, Tollison will hit the ball over his head, where Reedus is standing, five or six times, he dump a single in front of him. Here's a little softly hit ball that's clutched by Hill. At third base is the runner's hole. Oh, you're talking about a guy in Tollison who's had just five extra base hits on the season. Home run and four doubles, so... It would not be very difficult to align your defense when you look at those numbers, even if you hadn't seen him play. Henderson has singled and been hit by a pitch. The RBI total is low. Not for most leadoff men, but for Ricky. Consider that he's hit 11 homers. Breaking ball outside, and this is a DH league, so you don't have the same situation where the leadoff man follows the pitcher in the National League. And he has 25 RBIs. Really, it'll show you the indication of what kinds of players have been batting in the 8-9 and nine slot most of this year for the Yankees. Ricky hasn't had that many RBI opportunities. 2-0. Foul two and one. Pally Arulo at third, Salas at second. Meacham who beat out a bunt at first. Henderson not hitting as much out of the crouch as he did the past few seasons. And really, he had a reading coming out of spring training. He said, look, uh, if they call the high pitch a strike on me, I might as well stand up, and I may as well go for more home runs this year. His ball's rolled towards short. They won't double Ricky. One, or will oh. they? They do. They do. The Yankees had the bases loaded with nobody out. And Allen, leading a charmed life, gets out of it. Look at Kijan unload this ball to Manrique. And with the ball... Inside, Henderson opening the hips with a little slower jump out of the batter's box. And with a bad leg, he couldn't beat it up. Yanks have seven hits, a walk, and a hit batter, and one run. Mm. Ricky Henderson, who bounced into the short to second to first double play to end it for the Yankees in the fourth. In the third inning, Bob, the Yankees have the bases loaded with one out. Mattingly overruns the bag. Manrique tags him out. Fourth, bases loaded, nobody out. They come up empty. So they are still a team that knew they were going to have to do a lot of their work with their offense has seen their offense struggle over the last six-plus ball games. The Yankees have left six in the game, and that doesn't reflect Mattingly being tagged out on the overrun of the bag or the runner erased on the double play. Mm. This grounded a short his first time. Drops a bunt down. Good idea if Haliarulo was deep, but it's foul. Not unusual for him. Plays you deep. Play him deep, play him to pull. He'll do that. Did it more earlier in his career. Also stole a lot of bases when he was younger. Does he have Hall of Fame credentials? One of the best catchers of all time. I'll tell you, he is very close. Punch fists. He's had longevity. He's hit home runs. Some had criticized his catching, but he was always a good thrower. You could get a lot of arguments about that. Tommy John obviously operating on a year-to-year -year basis now with each contract he signs. Will be 45 next season. Expect to see him in a big league uniform? I'd have to say so. Look, for a long time during this season, he is the stopper on this staff. Roden struggled along early. A guy that was going to be a college pitching coach in North Carolina. 
that White Sox pitching staff in the 60s with Joel Horland, Gary Peters. You know, we've talked over the last few weeks, Bob, about there being many more low ball hitters in baseball than ever before, and most scouts can remember through their observation. But I think that is something that helps a Tommy John for that reason. He's a low ball pitcher, and he's facing low ball hitters, and yet the low balls he gets you out on are pitches like the last one. They are pitches that are between the knees and the ankles. This was an awfully hard sinker that Steve, uh, Pudge Fist never complained about, but it went down in a hurry, didn't it? Here's a guy that plays that. He said, you're a low ball hitter? Good. I'll throw you low balls, but low balls out of the strike zone, which you don't hit too often. Williams had a soft single to center his first time. He swings and misses. George Steinbrenner is in the booth now, and when the Yankees come to bat in the top half of the fifth, we'll speak with Mr. Steinbrenner. In the air to center, Washington goes back, has plenty of room, and a few strides shy of the track, he puts it away. We'll see if we'll get Mr. Steinbrenner, the diplomat, or Mr. Steinbrenner, who sometimes has been known as being somewhat volatile and emotional. The man who's the bottom line says you win or, or whatever, I don't know. We'll find out for you, folks. He's got a smile on his face now, but we'll see when Costas gets to grilling him. <laughs> oh, that's right. Put the onus on me. <laughs> As if you've been the president of the Steinbrenner fan club for the past decade. I want to keep smooth relations as they have been for the last couple of years. <laughs> I'll be your secretary of state. Sorry, this, this and what a state we're in. <laughs> Gijen bounces it foul. He had a five-hit game against the Yankees about a month or so ago at Yankee Stadium. Steinbrenner, Kubek, innocent bystander. <laughs> He's seen his team struggle over the last six, seven ball games, but they still have a lead in the Eastern Division. Liner for another base hit. I don't know when, Bob, there have been more outstanding shortstops in one league. When you look at, and I'll start from you know, Dick Schofield, who's injured now, outstanding defensive player. You look at Trammell. Cal Ripken, Fernandez, Fernandez Ozzy Gijan gets lost in the shuffle many times because it does not have good running speed, but he is so quick, and you've seen how he can hit. Julio Franco, at least Franco, offensively at yeah. Cleveland. And, and Julio makes errors, but he covers an awful lot of ground. Even guys like Dale Swaim with the Brewers, or Quinones, the former Red Sox now with Seattle. Those mm -hmm. guys are all right. You know, Peter Gammons made a very interesting point in this week's Sports Illustrated. In the 70s, there appeared to be a dearth of outstanding shortstops in the American League. Luis Aparicio was the only American League shortstop to hit over 300 in the entire decade. He did it in 1970. Now a guy like Eugen, who might have been an all-star if he came along at a different mm -hmm. time in baseball history, is just lost in that cluster of outstanding shortstops in his league. Ball you, one to Manrique. You notice how smartly the White Sox have been hitting today off Tommy John. All five of their base hits to this point have been to the opposite field. So they're taking the sinker ball, trying to get something out over the plate and go the opposite way to try and negate the sinking action of Tommy John and the change of speeds. John went the distance his last time, his only complete game of the year. And keep in mind, not only was he very sharp, throwing ground ball after ground ball, but that's in the controlled conditions of the Metrodome. Here's a 44-year-old man on a sweltering day in Chicago. I'm sure if Lou Pinella gets six good innings out of him today, he'll be satisfied. Enrique holds off. Peel goes down to Greg Kosk at first base. He waves the safe sign. Another reason why that one pitch with so many hitters trying to go the opposite way on Tommy, that little cut fastball in the fist of the right-handers, something he's come up with over the last year and a half, has seemed to be more effective. Been able to jam a few more guys up and in this year. Three and out of Manrique, Salas throws over there. Ossie has stolen 13 bases, been caught six times. Meanwhile, John, perhaps preoccupied by Guillen, Runs the count out to 3-0 on Manrique, the number nine hitter. Reedus would be next, and he's got a pair of singles against Tommy. 
It'd be Waltz Benrique, obviously. Guillen moves into scoring position, and he does walk him on four pitches. They had walked Calderon intentionally in the first, so that's the second walk issued by John. This is the kind of situation where you get men in scoring position. As Pinella has a little conference, a little bit with Mark Connor, the pitching coach, and checking the pitch count with somebody behind him, although that doesn't really matter a lot with Tommy John. But many times, the hitter will ask for the ball in this situation. You get men in scoring position off Tommy John, in a close ball game, and that's when, whether it's true or not, he's alleged to scuff the ball, hitters ask for the baseball at times. Because if he is going to doctor a pitch, it'll be a situation like this. As Manrique headed down to first, Nancy Fouts, Whoa. the inventive... Go ahead. Tom, excuse me, but Tommy John couldn't believe that last call. He thought he had strike written all over, added Salas. Voltaggio did not give him the pitch, so Tommy John gets in the hole. Excuse me, Bob. Nancy Faust serenading Manrique after the walk with the Bengals walk like an Egyptian. You know, some of that is the way Salas caught the pitch. He slapped down on it. When it crossed the hitting area, home plate, the front of it, it was probably a strike. But Salas knocked it down at full voltaggio. A ball and a strike. My all-time favorite, Nancy Faust Riff. Al Pardo used to catch for the Baltimore Orioles. Whenever he came up, and now Voltaggio and John are going at it. Which really is on Tommy John like. He rarely argues on the pitch, but he thinks he is still bickering, I believe, on the first call. And perhaps Voltaggio said something back, which umpires seem to be more prone to do these days. They almost spade players. Tommy John won't quit. He's coming back. More and more umpires are doing this. I guess like anything else. And I'm a union man, but the stronger a union gets, the more vocal they get, and the umpires have a very strong union, and they will say, look, come and get me, and if you take the steps for me, I may kick you out. So Pinella comes to the rescue of TJ. And generally speaking, Voltaggio has not been squeezing the plate no. today. Anything but that. He's had a fairly liberal strike zone. George Steinbrenner standing by. We talked to him in the top half of the fifth. Here we're in the last of the fourth. White Sox trying to add to a 2-1 lead. Two and one. Well, the world awaits the completion of this story. Al Pardo, <laughs> catching for the Orioles, comes up. Nancy serenades him with the Jeopardy theme. A tribute to Don Pardo, who oh. used to introduce Art Fleming back in the old days. Two and two. And wasn't that worth waiting for? <laughs> oh, it was good. Oh, yeah. I, I liked it. I, I wish you had done it with your Don Pardo kind of brogue and nasal quality tone. Lou Pinnell on the verge of exploding, I think. Reedus strikes out to end another threat. Both of these clubs have had ample opportunities to put big numbers on the board. It's just a 2-1 game at the end of four, and we'll be back after these messages from your local station. All right, and we're back, and as promised, George Steinbrenner joins us. And before you came into the booth, George, I was making the point, and this is in no way to absolve you of all blame for all situations through your whole career, but I, I think it's at a point now where people expect things of you and fairly pedestrian comments, fairly pedestrian actions draw unusual reactions just because it's George Steinbrenner. There is no way after Wayne Tolleson boots a ground ball, if he plays for anybody else, that a television director takes a shot of that owner in his boot. Well, that's true. That's But, uh, you know, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. And that's been the case uh, for a number of years. But I think uh, it's something that in certain ways I ask for and I have to be able to handle it, that's all. You don't get much privacy at a ball game, though. You, have, you cannot be happy the way your team has been performing in the last couple of days, let alone since the All-Star break. I always loved this town, but I've had a very lousy time in Chicago yesterday and today. Oh, oh Eddie Eyes for <laughs> <Yeah. thing>. <laughs> <laughs> He has not been a good host. <laughs> Isn't he one of those that a couple of years ago you called one of the cats, the cats and jammer cats? Yeah, and now he and Reinsdorf are probably with C, like my closest friends in baseball. <laughs> Here's the 0-1 to Claudel, a ball and a strike. I wonder if the FCC's fairness doctrine applies to baseball owners. 
<laughs> yeah, but you can talk about umpires now. I suppose you read that yesterday. You're allowed to say things about them now. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, the Dallas Parks lawsuit and the umpire vindicated. You say it's part of Americans' That's venerated right. tradition. That's right. To exactly get on umpires. Right. That's right. And it is. It's part of the ball game. But it did help to have the Supreme Court Appeals Court in New York uh -huh. say so. <laughs> Breaking ball is slapped to short. Gijen is going to have to hurry to get Claudel Washington, and he does by half a step. That is some shortstop, this Gijen. Indeed. What he does to us. Wasn't there a, a deal discussed about a year or so ago, Gijen for Pasqua? No, I don't think they ever felt that they wanted to trade uh, Gijen. There was no Pasqua for Gijen. I, I'd love to... Uh, have him approach me again about this shortstop, though. He just kills us. He just well, offensive defense. George, some people from the San Diego Padres organization thought he wasn't fast enough and didn't have a good enough throwing arm to play shortstop, but they didn't realize the great steal he has for that position. He's got a sixth sense out there, Tony, and, and he's got to be one of the best shortstops in the game today, I think. I don't know. You're a great no, shortstop. Right. You ought to know. Mattingly right, a is. single twice. What about the possibility of acquiring one of two White Sox pitchers, Bannister or Dotson? Well, we've talked. We've been talking about it uh, with them, and uh, uh, we'll continue to talk, I assume, uh, right up to the deadline. And uh, something could happen. Something might not happen. I don't know. I've been so far, you've got to give Trout a little more time. The next outing will tell on Trout whether we made a good deal or not there. I don't, uh, you know, so far he hasn't done that much. But. Mattingly is three for three. the pitch, Neil Allen looks into the dugout. He fell behind Chuno to Donnie. And it was a little fastball, a BP fastball, as they call it, batting practice, right down the middle of the plate. And then he looked into the dugout. I don't know if that was a sign that he might be tiring. How much does this ball club miss Willie Randolph, who's been so small oh, for so many years? You know, Willie Randolph has had such a year, and he's been such a steady. He's one of those consistent players. Jack Brickhouse and I were talking about the importance of having consistent ball players on your team. That's exemplified by Willie Randolph, I think, Tony. Are you upset with him for playing in the All-Star game? No, uh, you know, he wanted to do it. I'm upset with the fact that I think our team, Tony, in the last week has been a little preoccupied with the All-Star game and having so many starters and with uh, the home run record and a few other things, and I think we're making mental errors out here the uh, last three or four ball games that have no part in, in my scheme as far as baseball is concerned. What about this guy? You've actually tossed some words of praise his way this season. He told Marv Albert before the game he can't really react favorably to that because he wouldn't let himself have a negative reaction to the criticism of the Well, past. he can react any way he wants. That doesn't bother me. I give credit when I think it's due, and he certainly is entitled to it this year for the job he did when we had Mattingly and Henderson out of the lineup. He just was awesome. Here's a high hopper. Gijen will try and turn two to Manrique for one, and they get it. The inning went by quickly, and we'll ask George Steinbrenner to stay in the bottom half of the fifth. It's still 2-1 Chicago. And we bring you another edition of Baseball Remembers. George Steinbrenner has joined us in the booth at Comiskey Park. Bob Costas along with Tony Kubek. Mr. Steinbrenner, how many games have you attended this year? How much has been made of you cutting back? Yeah, not as many. I've uh, been busy in other things, and I think I've only seen about a dozen games. That's about all so far. I hope to see more in August and September, because I think that's when this thing is going to be settled, this American League race. I don't... I think... August and September are the key to the American League East. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I don't think right now uh, it's going to be settled who pulls ahead or who's behind, too. But when you get to those dog days in August and you get to September, uh, that's what's going to determine how your pitching staff holds up and uh, whether you have injuries. We've had the more injuries. They talk about other teams' injuries. Bob, we've had more injuries than any team in baseball, any team. And uh, here in Toronto, one of our main contenders hasn't had hardly any. Maybe any team in the American League, I guess the Mets and the Cardinals, especially with their pitching staffs being hit the way they have, might dispute it in the National League. Well, I'll bet you we've had as many disabled day list uh, days as any team in the, in the league. Or are, you, are you personally less volatile? Do you feel you are a less volatile man now than maybe two, three years ago? No, I don't think so. I, I think uh, I, uh, it appears that way, but uh, maybe less volatile on the outside, but uh, inside I'm, I'm oh. burning up when my guys aren't performing mentally. Donnie Hill whacks that one past Tommy John, who's upset with himself for not feeling it. One of those things that they feared about Tommy John at his age and his lack of mobility now, a sinker ball where you get a lot of balls hit back, they fear that he would get hit by a pitch. And he comes very, or a batted ball, that comes very close right there. Grass slowed it down, he reached for it, was by him. Between them, in less than five innings, these clubs have 14 hits, 
three walks. There's been a hit batter. Tollison made an error for the Yankees, and it's all added up thus far to just three runs total. Two one Sox. Baines has struck out and reached on that Tollison error, and he takes a ball. What about Glenn Hubbard? You're going to see Atlanta in the Hall of Fame game Monday at Cooperstown. I don't think so. They're looking for past when I don't think there's any chance of that. Meacham's played good second base for us. Uh, you can't complain. He doesn't give us, he gave us a little offense with that bunt today, but uh, he hasn't made many miscues out there since he's been in second. Thing. He seems more relaxed at second base than shortstop, and of course you don't, you're not as quite as involved at second as short, and it seems like he's been able to relax a little bit more. Well, your old pal Cleet Boyer has been working with our minor league infielders, and he says that he thinks Meacham can be a good second baseman in the major leagues. Cleet's one of the best teachers in the game. He I helped Ricky he... Henderson with base stealing. Uh, he did an outstanding job coaching third base for the Oakland A's and Billy Martin. Here's the 2-1. Three balls and a strike to Baines. Earlier this year, you offered kind of a lukewarm evaluation of Lou Pinello. Said he was doing a pretty good job. Where do you think he ranks among major league managers? Well, you can't say that a man his second year is one of the great managers in the American League. That's the question that was asked of me. I think on balance, he's done a good job. What's going to tell is what he does in August and September uh, when the gut-wrenching time comes, when you got to dig down deep. Uh, and uh, that's when we'll see just uh, how good a job he does. It's too early to say one way or another, but on balance so far, he's got his team in first place. The runner goes. Baines swings and misses. Salas's throw does not get Donnie Hill. Tommy John is upset. He does not feel that the stolen bases today against him have been his fault. And we have talked about Salas and his release not being very quick. Tommy John again keeping the ball down. Look at that. Salas is still in his crouch, and the ball has hit his glove. I'm sure they've worked with him to try and quicken up the release. he got Baines up, a left-handed hitter, so Salas had to throw over the top, but he didn't really come out of that crouch going towards second base before the ball hit his glove. Didn't get into action soon enough. I think Tommy's tiring. That complete game the last time out, and the heat, and they've had somebody warming up. Now the 3-2 pitch. And he got him. Ball strike three on the outside corner. It's the second time he's fanned Baines today. One of four strikeouts for TJ. How do you explain a Tommy John, Tony, coming back at his age and doing what he's done this year? You know, we talked about this before he got here. I think this limited strike zone that has helped the hitters has helped Tommy John. It's such a low strike zone now, and he's a low ball pitcher. So what he does was, and most hitters are low ball hitters now, unlike 20 years ago, I think he throws low below the knees. And he plays on these low ball hitters, and they swing at bad pitches. Yeah, that must be it then. Calderon locks one to left, and Henderson makes the catch. He's awfully smart. I mean, most hitters off Tommy John, they find him so attractive to try and swing at that yeah. they swing at so many bad pitches. And yeah. he's smart enough to work the umpires and the hitters. Yeah, I think he is. Let me ask you a question that may have legal ramifications, and I know <laughs> it's tough. Okay. I don't, but I, we know you can handle it. Okay. <laughs> Bob Cox is assured me. During the offseason, you've got a chance to get Jack Morris without giving up any players for maybe a million, million and a half. You pass. This is all in regard to the alleged collusion. And yet now you get a trout. You give up Shide Wilkins, two good prospects, and Tewksbury pitching today, and inherit perhaps a three to five million dollar contract. How can you, how can anybody make sense of something like this? Well, we got responsibility. Well, we got help on the contract from the Cubs. Okay. We got help on the contract. That was one. We gave thing. up three players. Though. Yeah, we gave up three players who, if we felt if Trout did the job for us, uh, we didn't need one of them, and that was Bob Tewksbury, and he'll have a chance to pitch it for the Cubs. He's pitched once already. And uh, at the time, don't forget, I had Willie Randolph sitting out there asking for a million three. I had a arbitration going with Mattingly that I knew I was going to lose in a million eight. And I had uh, Ron Guidry uh, out there asking for a million four and a half. So uh, I, if I'd have had those guys signed, I would have, uh, I couldn't, you know, I, I could have operated a little differently, perhaps. All right, next year. Now, next a guy like Cal Ripken Jr. is uh -huh. going to be out there, and you need a shortstop with no disrespect intended toward Tollison. Would you go after Ripken? Well, I'm going to have to think pretty seriously about it, I'll tell you that. If I had known that Gidry was not going to sign with me, we thought we were sure. We were up to the last minute. We thought we had him. Very last minute. I would have taken Morris. I'd have gone after him. But don't forget, the whole thing was kind of like a carnival. We'll come back with George Steinbrenner. Walker is caught looking. John has equaled his season high with five strikeouts, and through five, it remains. 
White Sox take a 2-1 lead into the sixth. George, you wanted to finish up on... Well, what I was question. saying was, you know, the whole thing was like a carnival. Dick Moss is a very sharp, smart young man and part businessman. And he was playing one against the other, and they'd come into your thing and say, we want a million eight, and you got two hours to decide. I wouldn't make that kind of a decision in business, and I wouldn't make it probably in baseball either. How can you expect a reasonable person, though, and I'm not just talking about the Yankees, I'm talking about the baseball business in general, to believe that there isn't some sort of collusion going on. All reasonable people applaud fiscal sanity. Well, I agree Not giving 240 hitters $600,000 guaranteed contracts, but it seems when the Dodgers are desperate for outfielders and they take a complete pass on Tim yeah, Raines well, and won't offer him the same amount of money that his previous team will offer, it seems like the owners are saying, well, we got burned on some Edsels, so we'll never again sign a Rolls Royce. What a play by Manrique to take care of Pasqua as we go to the sixth. Freddie's had a solid defensive game today, hasn't he? That uh, second baseman there has a great arm. That double play, that one where it was so close, I oh, don't yeah. think any other combination could have made it but Gillian to the second baseman. Well, Manrique basically a shortstop. That's how he was trained in the Toronto Blue Jays organization. He brings that arm along with him to second base. Yep. So the uh, well, let me let me say this. Uh, you know, they we signed Ward this year. He was a free agent. Everybody said, well, he doesn't really count. He doesn't really count. He's been one of the reasons we're in first place. He's a heck of a player, and a lot of guys would like to have him. But Texas announced no. its intention not to resign. Well, if he couldn't sign within that, but there are other people out there trying too. But I, I must say this to you, that uh, nobody in baseball has ever told me not to sign a player. They know better than that, and they've never, and I've never asked anybody not to, and I don't intend to. Uh, I'm going to do what I think is best for my ball club. Now, I am in first place, so, albeit by only a game and a half. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm willing to live with the team that I have here. Pally Arulo with the ninth Yankee hit. And George, one and, run on nine hits. And I think two of Morris's losses came from the Yankees, as a matter of fact. George, the, uh, there's still got to be a lot of, I don't want to use the word fear, that's a strong word, regarding what the decision might be and what the power of the arbitrators might have. I mean, you've, you've got to be very concerned. It's never happened before. You've got to no. be concerned about what the ruling might be and what sure. kind of uh, responsibility this guy has. Well, I still say, he, I, I went before him. I was there for several hours, and I was impressed with him. And I'll tell you something. We still have the right uh, to run our own businesses. And the people, what the people have to realize is if we pay some of these, continue to pay these outrageous salaries, we're going to pass that on in the price of a ticket. We're soon going to become like pro football and pro basketball, where you're going to pay $25 a seat to see a game. Well, uh, you know, and we aren't there. We don't want to be there. But not if you only pay it for the real quality. Not if you only pay it to the Tim Raineses and the Andre Dawsons and the Jack Morrises and stop making foolish mistakes with middle well, and lower level players. That, that's one of the things that has to be changed. But you also have to say, you know, how much is enough? Is $2 million for playing a fun game like baseball? And it is a fun game. It's a kid's game. And uh, for playing baseball, $2 million a year, uh, I don't know whether that isn't too well, much. Wait, I, well, I there's can't. a short supply of players, though, George, and the demand is great, or used to be great among 26 teams, and supply and demand. True. But, but face determines the price of tickets and determines the price of a ball Face player. this fact. Here, take him Mattingly now. This year, he's making a million eight seventy five. He's been on the disabled list a couple times. I haven't had the performer with me a good deal. He was out in Crucial Series in Minnesota and down here, and he was out on the 14-day or 15-day disabled list before that. There are a lot of things that you have to take into account in running your business. And I just don't want to see it passed on, the cost passed on to the consumer, to the ticket holder who wants to take his kids to see a game. What about another issue? What specifically have the Yankees done in response to the post-Al Al Campanis atmosphere in baseball and the, uh, the renewed emphasis as Salas pops this one back, fist for a look, runs out of room. Well, let me say this. this is on trying to bring some sort of justice in the area of race to Al, baseball. Al Campanis uh, spent 40 some years in baseball and in the, in the 13 years I knew him I never heard him say a bad word or a word that would be be prejudiced to anybody and the time I knew him, I can judge only by myself where I'm concerned I don't really care where a man goes to church or the color of his skin it's always going to be is he qualified to do the job nobody is going to tell me I have to hire somebody if I don't think they can do the job but on the other hand they shouldn't try to tell me that there aren't good minority people out there are capable of filling jobs I won't buy that either so I judge on the ability of the man and that's what's made this country great and will continue to 
And uh, I just think that our problems in this country, if, if we deal with words and mismeanings and things, we're never going to get the real problem solved. And the real problems is getting education to the young people in this country, no matter what the color of their skin is. Make sure they have quality education, starting way down there. Isn't the real problem in baseball not a blatant prejudice where anyone would knowingly say, here's a qualified black man or Hispanic, but I'm just not hiring him, but rather some sort of exclusion, even if it's unintentional, exclusion of minorities from the pool of those considered. A case of insensitivity rather than blatant racism. And so what's baseball going to do about correcting that and creating a pool, not of tokens, but of qualified individuals That's who can I, be evaluated just as white you. candidates. I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. And I think baseball has taken bigger steps than any of the other professional sports as far as this year, uh, getting uh, Dr. Edwards in, who has been very impressive, working with Calvin Hill and his group, and uh, uh, Mr. Alexander, who I've known for some time, former Secretary of the Army, to, to see to help us do what we can do and to get these qualified people interested. See? Salas jammed, fouls it off. Neither Neil Allen nor Tommy John has been masterful. Allen has allowed nine hits. John has allowed two, a six rather, and two runs. The White Sox lead it two to one. You know, Bob, this might not be a problem just peculiar to baseball either. I don't see any major network presidents. Uh, I don't see any uh, major sports writers. Uh, I, you know, it isn't something just peculiar to baseball. It's a, it's a problem that this nation has, and we've got to get about the business of starting down with our young people. That's where it's got to start. Fisk will have room for this one, apparently, and makes the play. He had a tough battle against a tough shot. A little wind drifting the ball away from the Yankees really helped out. He just keeps Neil going, Allen, doesn't yeah. he? Oh, man, he, they finished him off four or five years ago. Neil Allen's been helped out the last three innings prior to this one by Yankee double plays with a lot of men on base. Now, Allen makes a good high riding fastball to Salas, who tried to pull it to the hole and couldn't get the bat around. It is definitely true, just to conclude your earlier point, that the faces who cover the game, which is now coming under such criticism, are disproportionately white. There are too few black sportscasters, black sports writers, virtually none among the writers who cover the game. And that is part of the reason why this problem was not brought to national attention more insistently until Al Campanis blundered on Nightline and did it on national television. Mm -hmm. George, while we have time, we're going to thank you for coming. But i got to ask you one question. There's yeah. a ways to go in this. There have been a couple more mental lapses on the behalf of your ball club, not driving in runs. You're in town. Are you going to schedule a meeting with the team or Mr. Pinella after no. this ballgame? No, that won't happen, no? Tony. Is not, that a certainty? Not, that's a, you, can, you can bank that. Okay. You can bank that. It won't happen this trip. But if we keep playing with a lack of intensity that I've seen in Minnesota and here, pretty soon uh, you may hear something. Uh -oh. <laughs> Is Ricky Henderson a culprit specifically? I'm not naming any names. That's the manager's job. He's got he's to do that uh, at this point. But uh, if, it doesn't, uh, if we don't start to pick up and play like we're capable of playing, and uh, the mental errors don't stop, then you'll, then you'll hear from me. I can't help it. That's the way I am. Yeah, but over 162 games, it's, it's really impossible, even for a $2 million ball player, to maintain an intensity and play through little injuries all the time. It's not like football. Well, I know you're right on that, but I still say you've got to do it, and you've got to do the best you can with it, and when you make the mental mistakes, you've got to study why. You learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes in life. And uh, I, I just want to see that intensity, and that's what got us in first place, and that's what will carry us through. Now, it's, it's got to continue, that's all. What's your biggest mistake, your biggest regret as Yankee owner? Biggest regret? Well, I'd say one of them was letting Reggie Jackson go. Uh, I, I've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, but don't forget, in the last 10 years, we probably we have won more games than anybody else in baseball, so we must have done a couple things right. Yeah, and I think you, uh, Dick Hauser was a mistake because he was a great manager, and he proved it after he left us. So I've made a lot of mistakes. See? How do you feel about the battle for New York versus the Mets for the affections of New York baseball fans. Mets outdrew you last year, admittedly a championship year for them, yeah. by about half a million. Yeah, they did, and that was a great year for them, but don't forget their fans have been waiting a long time for it, and uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, people don't perceive the Bronx as as safe as perhaps we'd like them to perceive it, and that's a problem. My parking around Yankee Stadium is a real problem. Thank Meacham George. pops out. This Thank session you. of Meet the Press is concluded <laughs> with our thanks to George Steinbrenner, and we'll be back to Comiskey Park in a minute. Let's take a look at the scoreboard. The Tigers trail the Yankees by two in the American League East and behind Dan Petrie. They have the lead today against California, 4-2. to two. That game in the seventh. 
I thought that our crack staff was going to give us a look at the rest of the scores. But I have been cruelly deceived. Oh, California got a run in the seventh. So now it's 4-3. The Cal Tigers in front, and the Tigers on a rampage of late. Boston 8, Seattle 5. That game in the seventh. Bill Buckner. I guess they've got to wait. The waivers are cleared and see if somebody picks him up. Let go by Lou Garman and the Red Sox. And the Minnesota-Toronto score, as you saw, even up at four. But it's tough to let a guy like that go. Cleveland, Texas, three apiece in the sixth. Phil Necro pitching that one for the Indians. The Mets won two from Houston last night. They're tied at three in the third today at Shea. Get a little change and get a little more speed in that lineup, didn't they, for Hallinier? Caminiti, the player of the week. Spat. And Caminiti, a third baseman, player of the week in the National League, just up in the minor leagues. Gerald Young with some speed in center field. Looks like Cruz may be available to another club in case they want him. Well, here's the difference between being in the West or being in the East in either league. Houston and Seattle have identical records, 47 and 49. And they're each very much in the race. Seattle is five back of Minnesota. Houston's four and a half back of Cincinnati. A base hit for Fisk as the diving Pagliarulo. Records like that would bury you in the Eastern Division of either league. Remember the last time up, Pudge Fisk tried to bunt, but a trickle foul. Here's exactly what happens and why he did it. Even though he did not get a base hit the last time after the attempted bunt that went foul, it kept Pagliarulo in maybe six, eight feet closer to the plate, and the next ground ball hit sharply by Fisk, but it gets by. Probably because Pagliarulo's cheat. So up comes Williams, the rookie outfielder, who's singled and flied the deep center. Tommy John behind the mound, stretching and trying to get the hamstrings loose and maybe the lower back. Don't know if something is wrong with him as he now almost asked for a trip by Salas to give him a little bit of breather. Pinella may have sent him out to say, look, is something wrong with him or is he okay? Taking a lot more time between pitches. He started that the last inning. Pat Clemens, the left-hander. That is Stoddard, the right-hander. Jeff Torborg behind them. Rich Sporty sent to the minor leagues. In the Columbus shuffle or shuttle or whatever. Shuffling back and forth on the shuttle. I think that covers it pretty well. <laughs> the hit by Fisk was the seventh for the Sox against John. Yankees have nine off Allen. We're in the last half of the sixth. 2-1 Chicago. Now they got Pagliarulo in tight, and I got to believe they're going to let him hit away. And Gijan and Manrique, eight, nine He squares, misses the bunt. One and one. Doug Rader flashing another series of signs, a former Texas manager. at first. Nobody out. Williams gets the bunt down. Pagliarulo with the play to first. Successful sacrifice. Meacham covered. When a team is struggling along as the Yankees are, you can see how they start. We saw it on the bases so far. Pinella managing a little bit base to base. Not hit and run. It's created a few double play situations for Neil Allen and the White Sox. Uh, you can see right there, one time Pagliarulo didn't go first to third, looked like he could. Henderson had a chance earlier. Now you got to play where you get a ball right out in front of the mound. He never even looked to second base. Might have had to runner, but they're playing such fail-safe baseball that he takes the sure out and doesn't get the lead runner. Might have been a play down there. With two for two today, Ejen has jumped five points to 299. You make the mental mistakes that George Steinbrenner talked about, and then you kind of pull in your horns and play too safely, and you lose that freedom of action. But now he's going to check it out with the veteran, see if there is something wrong with him. We talked about Tommy stretching behind the mound. Have seen no complaints from a hitter so far, or any thought that he might be scuffing a baseball. Relatively quiet. Manager on the other end of town, Gene Michael. I mean, his relationship with Dallas Green, the GM, doesn't seem to be that smooth as he wasn't even 
notified about the trout trade, but he has complained that they're getting away with it. He said, I'm going to, Gene Michael, I'm talking, I'm going to teach my pitchers to scuff the baseball unless it is stopped. We're going to bring in the left-hander, Clemens, to get to Guijan, eighth-place hitter, and Manrique. So Tommy John has had it. He leaves trailing two to one in the last half of the sixth. Fisk gets second and one out. Clements comes in to pitch to Gijen, and we'll come back to Comiskey Park right after these men. The fans of the Northsiders will have their turn coming up in the second half of the doubleheader. It's the Cubs and the Dodgers from L.A. with Vin Scully and Joe Garagiola out of the bullpen with Tommy John cooling off in the Yankee dugout comes Pat Clements. Clements, the former Angel and Pirate, as you see, is 2-1. and one. Last year with Pittsburgh, he was 0-4, but in 65 games had a good ERA of 2.80 and allowed much less than a hit per inning pitch, which is a pretty good gauge of how effective a pitcher is, and sometimes the one-loss record for a reliever is not the best yardstick. And what he does so well with that sinker ball is keep the ball in the ballpark and get you double play in a hurry. He needs some inner defense down, but he's another reason, Bob, why I think the addition of Trout adds more of a sameness to this Yankee staff. Another sinker ball pitcher, as is Tommy John, Trout, and you get a lot of left-handers and hitters see the same kind of pitching day in and day out, and it can hurt a staff. Kijan jumps on the first one, rolls it down to Meacham, who throws him out. The first time Ozzie's been retired today. On to third with two down is Fisk. So that'll leave it up to Manrique. Next half inning, we are going to give equal time to one of the bright people in the game, one of the owners of the Chicago White, uh, White Sox, Eddie Einhorn, and we're going to get a chance to talk about the deal with the Aziki Jens and other things along with him. So, folks, stay in there, and we do adhere to the equal time principle. Helps us keep our jobs. Manrique is grounded out and walked as he swings and misses. Could lose, can't win. Tommy John came in at 9 and 3 today. How much will that old body be able to exist during the second half of the season? I guess that's always a question mark when you reach that age. Slow roller to short. Tollison charges, throws on the run, and gets him. The White Sox strand another man, leaving Fisk at third. And we'll be right back after these messages from your local station. <laughs> Seldom has political pressure brought such immediate <laughs> results. Here was Einhorn just moments ago, and now here he is in the booth at Comiskey Park. He will get a chance to rebut any statements made by George Steinbrenner or throw in his own two cents. Now, here's what I want to know. When Steinbrenner said that Reinsdorf and Einhorn were Abbott and Costello, I'm just assuming, typecasting being what it is, that he was Abbott and you were Costello. Well, uh, at the time, uh, our weight at the time, it was debatable, I have to tell you. We were very nervous then. <laughs> and we weighed about 25 more pounds than we do today in the early days of our getting into baseball. I don't know what to say to you two fellas. You know, I love you, but after hearing the poet laureate of baseball, Mr. Steinbrenner, expound for two innings, I don't think there's anything left to say. I'll Wait and see. Is Jim Fragosi's job safe? You're going to start asking me those kind of questions, aren't Tollison you? going deep here, but not deep enough. To the edge of the track, Calderon for the catch. And that's about as well as Wayne is going to hit a ball. Talking about hitting the guy with a hard question right off no, the I, bat. I think those are questions that uh, we leave to our baseball men, our general manager. That's the way we act. I think we've been very pleased with Jimmy. We're in pretty hard times here. Uh, uh, we never expected uh, this to happen. We're in last place, and uh, we think we've got a better team than a last place team. We haven't been playing as well as we could, and uh, after those uh, great years we had in the first three years that we were in the game, uh, this kind of been heavy on us, and since owners are just fans, we're as disappointed as our fans out there, and I can understand their frustration because it's Jerry and my frustration. Compared to a George Steinbrenner, how actively involved are you in the day-to-day -day workings of your ball club? Well, I don't like to characterize any owner's uh, participation in the goings-on of the club. I think we've been visible. We're the only two-owner system, but our philosophy from the beginning, despite what some people may think because we might be out front or more outspoken, is we've left baseball decisions to our baseball people. 
And I think we're going to continue that because uh, I don't want the responsibility, very frankly. This is not a black and white game. It's the grayest form of a venture that I've ever been into. And any businessman who gets into the game of baseball is much better uh, leaving it to the baseball people. Bobby Thigpen in relief of Neil Allen here in the top half of the seventh. Hit up the middle by Henderson. He's got his second hit. Thigpen, who came up last year and really had an outstanding year, closing the year through very hard. This year, it looked like there were thoughts of making him a starter when he was in the minor leagues, sent him down to work on a little off-speed stuff, and now he's back in the bullpen. Is that an indication, Eddie, that there might be disagreements in your, in your organization between Jim Fregosi and Larry Himes, the general manager? No, oh, not at all. I, in fact, Larry and I were out in Hawaii watching Bobby Thigpen just last week. And uh, this is where we need him right now. Henry Cotto has come in to run for Ricky Henderson. So apparently the hamstring is bothering Ricky even more than we might have thought at the beginning of the game. And Henry Cotto, who has very fine speed himself, but not in the Ricky Henderson category, Cotto runs for Ricky. But uh, Washington takes down and in. Yeah, remember, Tony, that Bobby Thigpen has very few winnings in the game of baseball. He's a mm -hmm. converted outfielder, and the, the main reason we started him last year at Birmingham and this year is to really just get more innings of pitching in. Claudel wasn't able to stop the swing he started on that pitch, which was outside the strike zone, so it is strike one to him. What's the future of Comiskey Park, oldest park in the majors? Well, as you know, we uh, intend to build a new Comiskey Park right across the street. The legislation has been passed. An authority has been established, and uh, we hope to be in it by 1990 or 91. We hate to leave this old ballpark, but and it looks awfully nice when you look at it right here, but underneath it, it is uh, falling apart, and it's reached the end of its useful life. Will this new ballpark, in addition to having all the modern conveniences and advantages that a new building offers, Will it have the charm of an old park? Will it have natural grass? Will it have some sort of individuality in terms of the way it looks inside? Absolutely. We Washington believe in, it out. We believe in the uh, no artificial turf, and uh, it's all in the legislation, and we're going to try to keep the same archways as we have around here and uh, definitely combine the best of the old and the best of the new. What about deals that are presently being talked about all around Chicago. It seems like all season long, Bannister, Dotson. Well, we have a tendency here to uh, be a little too open in what seems to get into the paper. A lot of the deals I read about surprise us. Uh, obviously, a team in last place has to uh, look to improve its ball club. Uh, it's not always easy, but it has to be opportunistic. There are teams going for the pennant who might need one of our players, and we have to look at those offers. Washington tipped it back into fist glove for strike three. And now Mattingly, who started the day at 337 and has gone three for three. All those hits off Allen, gets his first look at Thigpen. And takes a ball. Cotto running for Henderson, who opened the inning with a single. At first with one out. 2-1 White Sox, top of the seventh. Henry has three stolen bases. He has not been caught this year. He's had very few attempts, not in many ball games. He's been on that shuttle bus back to Columbus. Good outfielder, good base runner. Kind of player that is a bench player here, but could be a starter for a lot of other teams. Eddie Einhorn of the White Sox in the booth with us will continue after Mattingly's at bat. A ball and a strike. I hope Maybe we go can... to the end of the inning after Maddox. <laughs> <laughs> tell you the truth. He's a great ball player. Mattingly, the first two pitches, almost looked like he was going to try and get something inside part of the plate off thick pen and get it in the right field seats. He may do that up till two strikes. Nope. Went after a real good tailing fastball. Mattingly asking the home plate umpire, was that a strike or not? The ball had great action, great movement on it. Here's another look at Thigpen's pitch and what Mattingly did with it. He looks like he opens up the hip a little bit, going to try and pull it, and the ball tails away, and he just barely gets a piece of it. Fortunately for Don, which seems to happen to great hitters, the ball goes foul. A weaker hitter, that ball is put in play by a bad swing, and he's out. 
Don't know why you see the Boggs, the Bretts, the Gwens. When they have a bad swing, they don't put the ball in play. The 200 hitter does, and he goes sits down. There goes Cotto. Mattingly fouls it again in that same direction. Eddie, what uh, what areas have you been disappointed? In? You came in this season. It looked like you'd have a good pitching staff. And De Leon has struggled off and on. Bob James has been up and down. Uh, Bannister up and down. Of course, you've had trouble. Carcavice, uh, a good example. Like an outstanding catcher. He struggles. Second base, third base. You've been disappointed? Yes, hitting has been the bane of our existence for the last couple of years. Uh, it really fell down by some of the new people we acquired, uh, Redis and Hill. Their averages weren't where they should have been. And then uh, the middle of our pitching, the, the long men didn't do the job a lot, and we got down in a hurry. But we should be competitive in our division. Cotto going again. Here's a little pop. Back goes Hill in foul ground, and he makes the catch. Get a Einhorn to stick around. He, along with the rest of you, will enjoy this edition of Seventh Inning Stretch. Cotto, who ran for Henderson, stays in and plays left field, Ricky's old spot. Clements to work in the last half of the seventh. White Sox trying to add to a 2 1 lead with the top of their order Reedus, Hill, and Baines. Wonder if Ricky re injured the hamstring, which is still bothering him and trying to beat out that double play ball that he just missed on early in the ballgame. They have had their share of injuries. Oh, and a strike to Redis, who's two for three. There's a guy in town with the Yankees who's a member of their broadcast team, Ken Harrelson, who used to be here on the air with you and then was your general manager for a season, and it was a season that did not work out well. Do you regret hiring Ken Harrelson, and under what terms did he leave? Uh, well, we don't regret doing anything we do when we think it out and uh, it doesn't work out. That's the risk of uh, being in this business. Uh, unfortunately, Hawk was not happy in this job. It was a tough year and uh, I think the strain on him uh, was just too much and he left under very good circumstances. He told us he wanted to and, uh, and he did. I thought he did as good a job as he could under the circumstances and uh, he just got caught up in a very difficult thing where we were trying to get a new stadium and I think the, the fans and a lot of the city were kind of down on the club. And there was a little friction there with Tony La Russa and uh, it all mushroomed to something that was much bigger than it really was. Reedus narrowly missing in a bid for an extra base hit. Count holds it one and two to him, leading off in the last half of the seventh. And as you see, he's had a productive day. Eddie, we asked Mr. Steinbrenner this, but do you fear for the state of the game with the alleged collusion hearings and what may come of that? Does anybody know what might come out of it? No, I think I fear for the state of the game because uh, it seems to me that uh, our labor management situation is not what I would like it to be. It's too adversarial, and uh, that's why I fear the game. I, I think... Uh, We've become much too combatant in that area, and, and I wish there would be a leveling out. That's what I fear. I, I'm not going to comment on the specific uh, situations, but uh, I just don't like to see it. doesn't belong. This game is at the height that it's ever been between the white lines, but outside the white lines, uh, there are things that I don't like, and I didn't get in baseball to be in this situation. Hit hard. Tolleson, who had an error earlier, can't recover, and he's got another one. It is not unusual, Bob, I don't think, to see a shortstop who is hard infield who's having trouble with his shoulder to change the pace of the way he's playing a ground ball, trying to hurry a little bit more, knowing he's got a fast runner, but knowing also that his arm is hurting him, almost a slight shoulder separation. By doing that and hurrying it, charges the ball and he makes another error. He's trying to compensate for that sore shoulder. They're in for the butt again. Hill one for three had a single his last time. Reedus has 31 steals counting two today. Your He's... bunch you got Baines up next Bobby excuse me but that's why it's been so nice that Yvonne Calderon has been good protection even though it's left-hander against Baines left-hand if they advance the runner 
you know, Calderon has given him some kind of protection with his hitting. Reedus is now second in the league, I think, to Reynolds. Unless Fernandez has stolen a few today for Toronto. He had 30 beginning the day. Reynolds led with 35. What's your timetable now? Back in 83, the White Sox won 99 games, ran away with the division, came within a play or two of winning the playoffs against the Orioles. You look like a very strong team for years to come, especially the way your pitching staff was lined up at that time. What's your plan now for getting the club back into contention? How long will it take? Well, we had a plan to start, and we did it through, uh, high, to, through signing a number of free agents to start because we had a weak farm system. We then put a lot of money into that farm system, figuring in five years it would produce the Mattingleys and the, uh, the young stars. It did not. Uh, we have to go back to the boards again, and we're doing it now. We do have some good prospects. We hired Larry Himes, our new general manager, who had an outstanding record with the California Angels. But we don't like to talk about 88, 89, 90. I mean, we're a now team, and uh, we want to win just as badly as anyone else now. So we're going to do what we can now. Uh, but really, we... We have to look to that farm system because the game has changed. There isn't that much free agent movement because the statistics show the long-term contracts uh, to men who have had one good year do not mean other good years. And I think everybody in baseball knows that now, and the game has changed. But that brings up the inevitable question. What about all the prospective free agents who have had more than just one good year, but have had year after year? Throughout their careers, the Dawsons, the Rangers, the Jack Morrises, coming up, Cal Ripken, Jack Clark, Mike Schmidt, who says he wants to stay in Philadelphia, Dale Murphy in Atlanta. None of those guys appear to be one-year wonders. They could help any team. No, I... Again, uh, Good play by Mattingly, turns it into a double play. It was a good hit and a good play by Mattingly. He is probably just a little bit shy of Keith Hernandez on the other end of town, but not by much as far as his defensive ability. He has the same intensity, Bob, with that first baseman's glove as he does in the batter's box. I need to answer your question, Bob. Uh, as you know, there's so much legal thing going on today. I don't want to get into a, a large talk about it, but I'll give you a comment after we come back here. All right, Bain right. shattered his bat. Tollison threw him out. Neither of Wayne's two errors today has hurt the Yanks. We've completed seven, and it's 2-1 White Sox. This telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Looking at a still shot of Ricky Henderson, the word from the Yankees is he has not re-aggravated the hamstring Wait a second. injury, but that he is all right and was removed from the game for a rest, which Wait is curious in a 2-1 <laughs> uh, game yeah. when with he led off bat. the inning yeah. with a hit and second base is there to be stolen. It's a party but that's line what the statement. Yankees party said. line statement. There might be, and we're speculating, there's a little disciplinary action there, perhaps. Perhaps, I don't know, maybe Lou Felt, he wasn't nothing, but Ricky, as Dave Winfield told Marv Albert in the pregame show, has been playing with injuries and trying to play through them. With the Yanks down by one, Winfield leads off, Owen won the count to him. Big pen and relief of Allen. And this one is popped meekly into right center. Manrique back, called her on in, Manrique makes the catch. Eddie Einhorn, we cut you off with the inning ending abruptly last time. You can yes, your I, answer. I think that I wanted to say that there are a number of factors uh, that have uh, resulted in less movement of players as there were five, six years ago. I think economics was the biggest factor of it. A, a player might be worth more to one team than it is to another. The economics come into effect. And I have to tell you that even players who have great records and have, have put together a number of good years, when they sign the long-term contract and move, the record is very clear that the performance hasn't been there. So I think it's a combination of that and economics that has led to the situation. I don't think it's any more complicated than that, though a lot of people want to make it more complicated. Well, I would disagree with you in that I think you could find the same kind of study from the Players Association that would show that the quality players on multi-year contracts have made baseball ownership a lot of money and drawn a lot of people in the stand. At one time they did, but I think there's a limit. Shattered bat. Hill ranges almost to the shortstop's position. 
to throw fastball out. In fairness, there are also a bunch of guys, pitchers with lifetime records under 500 and career 240 hitters, who are still collecting deferred payments and either performing abysmally or in some cases are completely out of the game, and the owners have to shell out paychecks to phantoms. Who signed the names on the dotted line to give them those kinds of dollars? Is that toward judgment or is that the player's fault? On the other hand, no one's saying it's the player's <laughs> fault, but in fairness, if owners have been guilty of poor judgment in the past, they shouldn't be doomed forever to repeat the poor judgment. They can make adjustments. I'm acting as your spokesman here. Are you enjoying this? Well, thank you. <laughs> no, I think it's a, an issue that's very volatile, and as I say, it's in uh, the hands of arbitrators and very, uh, again, it's uh, very too controversial for me to get too much in it, but you've kind of stated it like it is. Last question. You were very instrumental in the negotiation of the big TV contract last time around with ABC and NBC. A lot of people think that baseball is going to have to bite the bullet this time around. Not going to get the same kind of money. Well, I think that baseball uh, is today the greatest attraction on television. I think the ratings are higher than they've ever been. Uh, I think, like everything else, a business change, you must adjust to it, uh, just like the NFL did uh, with the use of cable to balance out its package. We have a little too much exposure now on uh, cable because of the satellite transmissions and superstations and everything. But I think in the long run, when the time comes, uh, baseball will be happy and the networks will be happy. And before I leave, I'd like to compliment you and Tony, Vin and Joe, and the whole NBC staff because you've done wonders for the game of baseball for many years before I've been in it. And we thank you for your great coverage of the game and bringing it to all America. Thanks very much. And now the key question. Still involved in wrestling at all? <laughs> well, I have to admit, it's good to know when I was involved in wrestling that at 8 o'clock, I knew how it was going to come out at 10. <laughs> I don't have that feeling when I come to the ballpark. Thanks, Eddie. Give our best regards to Mr. Fuji and the Iron <laughs> Sheik, okay? Thank you, Eddie. Okay, Bob and Tony. Thank, Thank you. you. Saw a great example right there of a brushback pitch as opposed to the bean ball. One ball, two strikes. Pally Rudo leaning over the plate. Thick Ben moves him off. And the count holds at two and two. Nobody on, two out. Top half of the eighth. If this score holds up as is, the Yankees are going to be wondering all night until they get back out here tomorrow to conclude this series, how in the world only one of them crossed the plate in this game? Well, if it stands up, it'll be 20 runs scored by the Yankees in seven ball games. That's going to be a hit. It'll be the 11th hit for the Yankees, and Reedus is unable to come up with it. Pagliaruma might make third. He's on his way, and he's in there. A single and an error, no doubt. With the ball in the gap, Reedus' obvious thought was, I got to cut off any thought on Pagliarulo's part of getting into scoring position with two outs. So instead of getting in front of him, he tries to make the quick pickup here, and he can't come up with it. He just misjudged the angle and tried to get on the ball a little too quickly and cut it off. It'd be a tough error to give him. Because he did have a long run. And the count went to what it was, two and two. He looked like he shaded a little bit more to the line with Thigpen with a good sinker ball going the other way. He felt that Pagliarulo was going to go that way and he hit the gap in left center. It is scored as a single and a two-base error on Reedus. And now a hit for Salas to get the Yankees even. He's one for three. I'll tell you, they've had their chances. Bases loaded, no outs. Bases loaded, one out. Double play that killed them. Oh, two outs now, obviously. You mentioned the Tim McCarver comment of last Monday about Salas's name being a palindrome, spelled the same backwards and forwards. The only others we could find, Truck Hanna, Dick Nen, Toby Hara very recently, and Eddie Kazak. Two and one. There should be a question that's been around for a lot of years. Lou Pinella looking for a base hit with two outs and tied up. fans here. A lot of noise greeted that hit from Salas. Tremendous amount of emotion on the Yankee bench. Something that's been missing for a while. In fact, a good part of this ball game with all 
the mistakes they seemingly have been making. Looked like he had a pretty decent pitch, too. She's down a little bit away, went out and got him, hooked it to right field. We're going to have Mike Eastner pinch hit. Jim Fregosi waiting until he is put in the ball game. He's hitting for Meacham. He's been announced. He's had Ray Searage, a left-hander, throwing in his bullpen. There's Searage. Played in the Milwaukee organization for a while. Basically been a power pitcher most of his pitching career who can't have trouble with control. Now, Pinnell is checking what's available. He's used Cotto already. He went into the game and ran for Henderson and is now playing left field. Oh, he's, he's got, got Bonilla, Ward. he's got Ward, and he's got Cerrone. And Paul Zabella. We're going to make a move. It probably would be a Ward, who is a guy they got, as Thick Penn leaves, a guy they got to help them against left-handed pitching, and he has done just that. The record was not good against left-handers. Thick Penn leaves in a 2-2 ball game. We'll be back after these messages. Exit Big Pan and enter Searage, and shortly Vin and Joe will be entering for the broadcast of the Cubs and Dodgers' second half of the doubleheader today. Easler's going to stay in. He was the lone left-handed hitter Manella had available off the bench. He sent him up in theory against Big Pan, and he lets him bat as Searage comes out of the bullpen. Less than two outs, we probably would have seen Ward. Searage in his 34th ballgame, all in relief. He can get in trouble walking too many people. Sometimes you go out there, have an outstanding fastball. Other times, doesn't throw quite as hard. Like so many others of these pitchers for Dick Bosman, the pitching coach, inconsistency has hurt this staff. Serridge is 31 years old, started out in the Cardinal organization, never played with them at the big league level, was briefly with the Mets in 81, then with Milwaukee before coming to the White Sox. And Easler hits the first one lazily to left. Reedus will be there. And he makes the catch. However, his air hurt. You bet. The Reedus error on the two-out single by Pali Arulo, allowing Mike to reach third from where he was driven home by the Salas single. That's what allows the Yankees to tie this one up as we head for the bottom of the eighth. Easler batted for Meacham, so Juan Bonilla comes off the bench. He's just arrived with the big club this weekend from Columbus. He played last night and went 0 for 3. Bonilla is the new second baseman. Before Clements goes back to work, let's check what's happening elsewhere. The Angels have tied that game in the ninth at Detroit. Royce and Petrie were the starters. Boston finishes it at Fenway and beats Seattle 11-5. Fouled off by Calderon. About a couple of nights ago, Mickey Vernon, the former hitting instructor, minor leagues and the major leagues for the Yankees. Eddie Lopat, a former pitcher, Toronto 6, Minnesota 4 in the 6th. Sat with Bobby Cox in the Minnesota Atlanta game, and speculation was they were looking at Glenn Hubbard. They deny it. How long would Randolph, Randolph be out? Oh, Calderon was leaning into that one because he was running up to bunt. Now, that's a very extreme example because of the bunt attempt. But something like that is happening elsewhere around baseball. This just shows you the most extreme possibility. Guys are leaning into pitches. Now, here is a pitch that was almost over the middle of the plate, although it was high, so it was called a ball. But guys are leaning into pitches on the outside portion of the plate and are sometimes being hit by pitches that are barely a couple of inches off the inside corner. And this one is walloped into left center field for extra bases. It rolls to the 409 side. Can he get three? He's going to stop at second. He thought about it. He holds with a leadoff double. After coming off the DL, they toyed with making him a third baseman to get a little pop. But when Baines had the knee problem, they could put him in right field. They'll have a problem where they're going to do with Calderon when Baines comes back. For Calderon, that is double number 23. He's also got 14 home runs. You're talking about a guy who's just in his 80th ball game. So he's added some extra base punch. He has been one of the pleasant surprises for the White Sox franchise this year. Something they need. You get all the left-handed hitters with Walker and Baines and Haseki Jen. 
And they needed somebody from the right side. They thought it was going to be Reedus. It's turning out to be Calderon. Walker's 0 for 3 has dropped his average down to 239. Power numbers still respectable, as you see. He tails off quite a bit against left-handed pitchers. Although Clements is not a strikeout pitcher there. In at the corners, Mattingly and Pagliarulo. We may see him swinging away. Came up and in on him, and he fouls it back on the attempted bunt. He was actually just trying to pull away as the pitch sailed up. If he gets the bunt down, you got Fisk up, who's swinging, swinging a hot bat. That means you've got two bases to play with. Just to soon let, personally, let a walker, even though he struggles against left-hander, he is a good hitter, let him hack away. Give him a chance to drive the run in, try and pull the ball. He's in the hole. That ball got part of his bat, didn't it? Yes. Okay. They changed it on the scoreboard. Right. Strike one, the count. Squares again. Gets it down. Look at this play there by Mattingly. Whoops, he dropped the ball. Which takes nothing away from what no. Mattingly did. In the Keith Hernandez mold, charging that thing so aggressively, he took it on the dead run. Through to Pagliarulo. Now, Calderon had gotten a good jump off second base, so even had Pagliarulo fielded it cleanly, this was going to be a very close play. Let's Stop. see if he would have been out. No. Nope. He would have been safe anyway he if the would ball have been, squirts free on the tag. He would have been out if the throw had not tailed almost to the foul side. It's a much more dangerous play for Maddie to try where it's not a force situation. I saw him three weeks ago in Toronto, or right about three weeks, on the artificial surface, get the lead runner at third with runners at first and second. But that's got to be almost a perfect throw on a tag play, but you've got to give him credit for being aggressive, but he's now put his team in a hole. Here comes Rigetti. Right-handed batter Fisk coming up. But Pinella, in this situation, goes to his ace, and we're coming back. Mattingly pounces on the bunt, but apparently has to wait for Pagliarulo to get back to cover and has to hesitate on his throw for just a second. And that's where the play is lost. And as you'll see from the next angle we have available, Calderon was definitely safe, even had Pagliarulo held the ball as he made the tag. As it was, the ball was jarred free, but he is in there. And the play really was lost, not by Mattingly as much as it was by Pat Clements. For one reason, Pat Clements said, hey, I got a superstar, good fielder, and Mattingly at first base. Go ahead, Donnie, take it. The ball's hit right back at him, bunted too hard, not a good bunt, and he was still on the dirt surface when Mattingly ran in front of him. If he's aggressive, I mean, he, Mattingly's got to come over, you know, from 90 feet away. He, if he comes off five feet off the mound, there's no chance for Calderon. So really, Clements put Mattingly on the spot, and it hurt him. The Yankee infield comes in as Rigetti prepares to face Fisk. Pudge is one for three, had a single his last time up. Swing and a miss. Walker down at first, credited with a sacrifice, and he reaches on a fielder's choice to show you that A, he is not a particularly good bunter, and B, he has not that often been called upon to bunt. That is the first sacrifice of his career. Calderon with the lead run at third. Bottom of the eighth, tied at two. Rigetti has had very few save opportunities since way back early in July. He hasn't had that many innings pitched. They've had to pitch him in losing causes to get him work. For the year, he has 17 saves but he has failed to come through in nine save situations. You gotta wonder if the second half of last year when he was going for the record, if he still doesn't have a residue of tiredness. Remember last year, he, I think in the last 29 possible saves he had at the end of last year, the last three months, he was successful like 28 times. Which is even more awesome than what Willie Hernandez did for a whole season for the Tigers when they won it. They say he's throwing the ball better, whatever that means. The 1-1 pitch is popped up. Salas in foul ground for the catch. This got a pitch up in the strike zone that he could drive to the outfield, but he was a little bit late. 
tribute to the speed of Rigetti, who doesn't throw as hard as he did a couple of years ago, but it's almost as though Fisk was almost just trying to punch the ball to the outfield. A little late and popped it up. Manella trying to move somebody defensively. Well, they have the option now of playing back for the double play with one out. Well, with this guy hitting, Kenny Williams, is uh, he was a 9-3 sprinter in college. So you really are taking your, your defense in your hands and not too good if you play them back. They've almost got to play it. The middle infielders take a couple steps back. They are not in as close as they were when Fisk was hitting. They will creep. Williams bounces this one. It is foul. Ooh. And some quick thinking on Pagliarulo's part. Instantly he sized the situation up. If I take another quick step and grab it in fair ground, do I have a crack at Calderon at the plate? No, he decided. So he backs up and lets it go foul. You wonder if Roger Bossard, who is the third dash generation of Bossards, if his grandpa was here. Remember the Go-Go Sox of 59 with Aparicio? Billy Pierce is on that team. Fox, they had the lines tailored in so bunts and choppers would stay fair. Not for the grandchild, though. Roger, he's got them where they went out. Runner was coming all the way from third base. You've always got to be alert that they could have some kind of squeeze play on right here, too, with a kid up there, Kenny Williams. Now the road, a little bit better speed than you give him credit for. Just to stay out of a double player, the possibility. Pitch out. They thought it was coming. So it's one and one to Williams, who is single, fly to deep center, and sacrificed. Those signs from Doug Rader will be passed verbally to Calderon if it's on. Visually to the hitter, Kenny Williams. If there's a squeeze, the hitter, they usually want him to signal back so there's not a screw up that he got the sign. Two and one. If the runner should come, chances are, and it's always difficult to do with a catcher that's new to the organization like Salas. You hope he knows the system, but Rigetti will probably try and knock down Kenny Williams, throw the ball right out, make him get out of the way where he can't get the ball down. If the runner breaks, the runner's got to disguise it if he's coming. Can't break too soon. This one has hit the center field, not terribly deep. Calderon tags. Washington with a catch. Raiders sends it. Wow. Terrible throw. It. He catches the ball almost behind his head where he had to regroup, caught it with one hand where he had to regrip the ball, and the throw, he didn't have a good grip, just goes all over the place. That was a very, very short sacrifice block. An aggressive decision by Raider, the third base coach. He sent him, and any kind of decent throw would have made it a close play. And with not hitting the cutoff man, Matty Lee was the cutoff man. They gave a lot of freedom to the runner at first base. So he, Walker, go, or rather, the runner goes into second base. There's no cutoff man there. Or he was there, but there was no way that the throw was near the cutoff man. Excuse me. Ejan is two for three. Venezuelan shortstops, very much a part of the White Sox heritage. Chico Carrascal, Luis Aparicio, now Ozzy Guillen. Another of his countrymen, Davey Concepcion, still with the Cincinnati Reds. Three two White Sox. That's out of play. Before the game, Ozzy Guillen, and that is the proper way to pronounce his name, although he doesn't mind, as most people say Guillen, but you have brought me around, and now we're both saying Guillen. Manny San Guillen was here with a group of old-timers, and Ozzy said, look, there's Manny San Guillen. It depends upon the dialect and what country you're from, and sometimes what area of the country, I guess. I guess you and I are the only ones who haven't been converted to the anglicized version. Two and one. Even though the numbers don't show it, he has taken many more base on balls, but still a low total. Ozzy's become a much more disciplined hitter. Darren Johnson, look, take a couple strikes. 
He doesn't have to be willing, but now in the man in scoring position, he's been wailing. Two outs. Old-timers abounding at Comiskey Park this weekend. They retired the numbers honoring the late Ted Lyons and Billy Pierce, who was here for the ceremony. There's also an old-timers game here tomorrow. Jim Wynn in the bullpen. He saved the last three White Sox victories. The likes of Dick Allen, Moose Scourin, Wilbur Wood, Lou Brock. Reaches for it, rolls it down to Bonilla, who throws him out. The White Sox come through with a run in the last half of the eighth. Yanks come up for their last licks. Cubs and Dodgers are underway at Dodger Stadium. L.A. has a 1-0 lead in the first, and provided this one ends here in the top half of the ninth, we'll make the switch over to Vin Scully and Joe Garagiola for the second half of the doubleheader. The scheduled hitters in this inning, Tolleson, Cotto, and Claudel Washington, but Gary Ward has moved into the on-deck circle. He's swinging a bat. Good chance right here, Bob. Don't know if Fergosi will use that as soon as Gary Ward is announced. He brings in the right-hander, Wynn, who's loosened up in the bullpen, and you get the percentage in your favor for him and then Cotto to follow. So it may be a little trick of the trade that Fergosi's going to pull, but we'll find out shortly. We've got to pick an MVP, as always, a Miller Light Most Valuable Player, and... Mattingly had three hits. On the other hand, the Yankees, unless they comes. rally, aren't going to win this one, so it's going to be a tough here choice. Right. Here comes Jimmy. Yep, here comes Fregosi. There is not a left-handed pitch pinch hitter available on the bench to counteract this move, and Jim Fregosi looked at the master lineup card, sees who is left. Just Zavella and Cerrone, two right-handers, so... That was the kind of time with the 24-man roster. You wish Rick Roden was a left-handed hitter instead of right. You could put him up there if you wanted to. So Jim Wynn, who throws very hard, is going to come out of the bullpen and try for his fourth consecutive save. And we'll be back in just a minute. This doesn't mean we're giving up on the Yankees' chances, down by only one as we start the ninth, but we've got some house cleaning to do. The Major League Baseball game of the week has been brought to you by Miller Genuine Draft, cold filtered draft beer. It's as real as it gets by Buick and your Buick dealers, where better really matters. By Mikeadin, it cures athlete's foot. Step up to the mic. And by Mr. Goodwrench. No one knows your GM car better than Mr. Goodwrench. No one. All right, here comes Gary Ward, who is five for six with four RBIs as a pinch hitter. Last year, the Yankees played under 500 baseball in games started against them by left-handers. They were 24 and 29. This year, they're 20 and 11 when a lefty starts against them. Nearly 650 ball, and the acquisition of Gary Ward is a very important part of that. I wonder how many of those 61 RBIs, and I'm sure considerable, came against left-handed pitchers. Win seems to be a good workout. Wars for Jimmy Fregosi. He's been in 13 of the last 21 ball games. High in the air down the right field line. Calderon over into foul ground. Reaches in and has it. been looking for an MVP. If the score stands up, he gets a double, scores what could be the winning run, goes a row deep. The friendly White Sox fans don't hinder him. He's over the railing. If he's in Yankee Stadium or a strange ballpark, they might mash him as soon as he reached in. He makes a nice, nice play. Battles the sun, a little bit of a win, keeping the ball more toward the infield. Win has had the last three saves among White Sox pitchers. The last three wins. Up comes Cotto's hit. Five home runs. Win pitch yesterday. Two shutout innings, one hit. Three strikeouts. They really adjusted his delivery. Just to land on that front foot in the Pittsburgh organization and recoil, bounce back, and didn't really follow through. And Don Drysdale helped on that a little bit. Along with Dick Bosman and Jim Fregosi. Has he supplanted Bob James? Well, Bob James has had more downs than ups. And came in at a good weight this year. And at this point, he certainly has. Or James would have been in it right now. Win, as you see, is 
part of the growing list of relievers who work from the stretch under all circumstances, even with the bases empty. Clements, who was in earlier for the Yankees, is another one. Some think Bruce Souter started it. Right across town in Wrigley Field. Two and two, with one out, nobody on top of the ninth. Three, two White Sox. Three runs, eight hits, and an error for Chicago. Two runs, 12 hits. Two errors for New York. Breaking ball up and in. Three and two now. Bases loaded, no outs at one time in this ball game. The Yankees didn't score. Bases loaded, one out. They didn't score. Three consecutive innings. They hit the double plays. When we talk about an MVP, Reedus made an early bid. He had a couple of hits, two stolen bases, but his error in left field helped the Yankees tie the game in the eighth. Calderon in the bottom half smacked a double into left center, and his aggressive base running allowed him to beat Mattingly's throw on the sacrifice. Otto staying alive, although not without some pain mixed in as he fouled that one down off his tootsie. That running but especially sinking fastball that gets you from a right-hander if you're right-handed hitter. If it's a left-handed pitcher, it's usually that Ron Guidry or Steve Carlton slider down and in that you foul off the foot if you're right-handed hitter. Gene Monahan, the trainer out very quickly. You wonder where the Yankee bench is. Why not a pinch hitter? Well, some of the bench is playing because of the injuries. Henderson out of the lineup now. Randolph out. Cerrone's the only guy left. Yeah. And Zuvella. Cerrone and Zuvella. And well, Zuvella would be the guy more likely to be used with Cerrone being your reserve catcher in this and situation. And even the owners won that part of the collusion deal going unilaterally to the 24-man roster. They won that from an arbitrator. He ruled against the players. And so there's no way that the 24-man roster has helped the quality of playing Major League Baseball. That one extra player you'd see probably use now or a pinch runner you might use that so many managers cherish so much. You see all the so, players available to Fregosi on the right side. And just Zuvella and Cerrone, excluding pitchers, available to Pinella. Still three and two to Cotto. And here's a shot that is hooking foul. Yeah, if me to Jimmy Fergosi, he's got Daryl Boston, Steve Lyons from the left side, Jerry Royster, although he's got a bad knee, and Bill Lindsay, the young catcher they called up. And Jerry Hairston, a switch hitter who's been a premier pinch hitter in this league for a long time. But we may not, he may not have to use him. Hairston has led the American League in pinch hits three of the last four seasons. I think it was interesting that Mr. Eddie Einhorn, when he had him, wouldn't give a clear-cut answer on Fergosi. We didn't expect it, but I was hoping for a personal evaluation. Most baseball feel that Jimmy Fergosi has done an outstanding job, but the other side of the coin is you got to have a general manager in most cases and a manager who think together. They seem to have differences. 4-4, California at Detroit, Minnesota, 11-6 over Toronto in the sixth. Oh, so the Twins might be doing the Yankees a little bit of a favor. Hit the third. In comes Hill to pick it up and throw him out. So Cotto battled win. He fouled four of them off as the count went to three and two, but he's retired for the second out. I was starting to say a lot of people believe that while Himes and Fergosi may have their differences, it's nowhere near as big a gap as that which existed between Ken Harrelson and Tony La Russa before La Russa got the ax. Well, it was Ken Harrelson. It was the Hawk who brought Fergosi in, and if Larry Himes, and it sounds like he's got pretty much complete control with input from the two owners or some of the owners, that he'll maybe want to get his own man in, which is not an indictment of managerial skills of Jim Fergosi. Donnie Hill, a little bit easier to play on that. He and Walker playing on the lines in this 1-1 ball game. Trying to take the double away. Claude Washington 0 for 4. Yankees down to their last out and in danger of losing four in a row for the first time this season. If that happens, and if the Tigers prevail in extra innings against the Angels, with Toronto losing by five to Minnesota, the Tigers are going to vault over the Blue Jays and into second place. They'll be just a game out, and the Blue Jays would stay a game and a half behind. This one might drop. Gijen hustling out. Rita's in, and it falls in there. It 
It's one of those plays in this situation where you move the outfield back so that a ball is not hit over their head or they can cut off the gaps to prevent a double. So basically what happened was they were conceding just a little scribber like that. A ball hit in front of the line drive to protect, but what it does when you concede that, which is solid baseball, you get Mattingly in the batter's box. They're still deep. Kenny Williams in center is almost near the warning tracks, as are Calderon in right field, and left fielder Rita is still very deep. They still don't want to double where the runner can score all the way on a, or a long single even from first base. Mattingly, three for four. That's hiked his average from 337 to 342. Had three straight singles, then fouled to the third baseman. 0-1 to him. Washington at first, he's stolen seven bases, but he's not going anywhere with Mattingly at the plate. Winfield on deck. One and one. They have pretty much last night when he pinched it, and there's Winfield, and today in his start for Mattingly, tried to keep the ball away. Pitch him away and play him straight away and not give him the opportunity on breaking balls or fastballs inside in the strike zone to pull the ball. So he's just conceded and gone for three singles today. There it is again. This ball is Pitch hit in the air to left way. and Reedus is right there. The White Sox have won the first two games of this series and the Yankees have dropped four straight. A lot of double plays into by the Yankees. Ten men left on base and a couple of misplays. We'll be back to wrap it up at Comiskey in a minute. This week's NBC Miller Lite Player of the Game, Ivan Calderon. Miller Lite happy to present a check for $1,000 in his name to the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. He made this fine catch in the top of the ninth. In the bottom of the eighth, he doubled, sped to third ahead of Mattingly's throw on an attempted bunt by Walker and scored what proved to be the winning run. The victory to Searage, the save to win. He saved four in a row. For Tony Kubek, I'm Bob Costas. And good luck tonight to the Salt Lake City Trappers of the Pioneer League as they go for 28 in a row.